Are we ready to get started? Okay, good. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilman Rory Lantzman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System. Today we are here to examine New York State's newly enacted criminal justice reform legislation and to learn what the city will need to do to prepare for its implementation. For years, stakeholders have emph emphasized the need to make our criminal justice system fairer. Most justice-involved New Yorkers face the reality of a delayed, antiquated process that targets indigent and marginalized communities, perpetually stacks the deck against them, pressures them to plead guilty, and penalizes them disproportionately when they do. At the city level, the city council and this committee have worked to mitigate some of this harm by, among other efforts, providing meaningful alternatives to detention and incarceration, including supporting the expansion of supervised release, funding pre-arraignment diversion programs to remove people from the system as early as possible, improving bail payment processes and eliminating fees, and establishing a citywide charitable bail fund. Now the state legislature has finally passed real and meaningful reforms to our bail, discovery, and speedy trial statutes, which takes us many steps closer to the criminal justice system we want to see. <clears throat> Starting January 1st, 2020, these new laws will eliminate money bail for almost every misdemeanor and nonviolent felony, substantially increase the use of desk appearance tickets to prevent people from spending a night in jail only to be released at, an, at arraignment, mandate broader and more comprehensive discovery disclosure much earlier in the life of a case to prevent what has been called trial by ambush or defendant pleading guilty before seeing the evidence against them, and preventing prosecutors from declaring themselves ready for trial before certifying their compliance with the discovery mandates. But as with any major shift to an entrenched system, these reforms will live or die based on their on-the-ground implementation. Will institutional actors be dragged kicking and screaming towards new requirements, or that will they be warmly embraced as a profound good for our justice system? This city will have an enormous role in modeling full and robust implementation. January 1st will be here before we know it, and we must be ready. Today, therefore, we will hear from our district attorneys and the special narcotics prosecutor, the mayor's office of criminal justice, public defenders, service providers, and advocates on how they plan to implement these new reforms and what challenges they anticipate. We've been joined by Council Member Andy Cohen from the Bronx, and with that, let us uh, swear uh, the panel in, and we can get started. All right? If you raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. You do. Good. Um, you want to get started, Mr. Vance, and we'll go down, down, the, uh, down the road. How much time are we putting on the clock? Can, can we all strive to do five minutes and, and hit the highlights? We're going to do our best. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, thank you for inviting us to speak on these important topics. And, Turning to today's topics, I, I, I know you fully understand I, one cannot provide sufficient de detail in five minutes to address all the issues that you raise. But I would ask that uh, the written testimony which we have submitted be placed in the record uh, and, and, and will form the details of our submission. Uh, I and my office supported ending cash bail and expanding discovery. Uh, to your point, the new laws that have been implemented uh, make sweeping changes to our justice system, but they do so without a single dollar allotted to achieving that end. So to your points, let's start with bail reform. Uh, I believe that the cash bail system is fundamentally unfair, and because it so often results in wealth-based determination of who is in and who is out, it contributes to the stark racial and socioeconomic disparities in our jails. The legislature did not end cash bail, and that was a mistake. Instead, they restricted bail and detention to a patchwork of crimes under the additional restraint that a defendant's criminal history and current risk to the community cannot be considered by a judge in making this determination. The law also removes essentially all white-collar crimes from detention. 
further exacerbating the racial disparity in our jails and allowing criminals with financial means to go right back to their computers and continue decimating the lives of victims. As we look at the defendants who will be released on January 1st, we know, we know, they will benefit from a high quality supervised release program to ensure that they return to court as well as not reoffend. However, uh, New York's current supervised release supports are designed for individuals who require only reminders through text or other means to return to court. This is the uh, supervised release which our office funded. Um, to bring this program of supervised release up to scale, to begin to meet the challenges we're going to need to, to meet in January, Vera uh, Institute of Justice estimates it will cost $75 million a year to roll out pretrial services and supervised release across the state. I've also seen estimates that I believe are credible and perhaps more accurate that double that amount. What we have to work with today, however, to meet those needs is zero. Turning to discovery, since 2010, uh, our office has con continually revised its discovery practices, uh, but to implement the new reforms in our office and across the state, the state or cities must allocate resources to this endeavor that will allow for significant personnel and technology increases. That's a fact. A typical case in 2020 may encompass thousands of text messages, medical records, including x-rays or other imaging, insurance records, financial records, historical cell site data, search warrants for computers and cell phones, photographs, hours of surveillance uh, videos from private businesses or NYPD units, transcripts of various proceedings, recordings from the NYPD body cameras, and many other sources of evidence. Importantly, the new discovery requirements apply to all cases, including those resolved by pleas, unless the defense waives. Currently, more than 97% of cases are resolved by guilty pleas. And whether you believe that's a system that is good or not, uh, the reality is uh, that's the system that we have now. And under that system, defendants do not have the benefit of full discovery. It's not required. Now, our office doesn't have a specific dollar figure yet to identify what the costs of the, the discovery changes will be, but I can tell you that it will be substantial. We're not talking about trying to find quarters for the copier. We are talking about needing to create essentially a full-scale, high-tech reproduction unit with staff that includes analysis, analysts, paralegals, and lawyers. Second, I'd like to, under the discovery, talk briefly about witness safety. We also have to ensure witness safety and the cooperation of witnesses in our case to do our jobs. The new discovery statute mandates that the district attorney pri provide the name and adequate confirmation in contact information for all persons who have information relevant to any charge within 15 days of the defendant's first appearance in criminal court. As indicated, le currently less than 3% of cases go to trial. So historically, the identities and statements of victims and witnesses have been protected from disclosure. Now, it's a different reality. We have to hand defendants uh, uh, a roster of who has spoken out against them uh, in just 15 days after their first appearance, absent a protective order. And that's a seismic change in our uh, New York State justice system that uh, will, I think, one could predict, it will undoubtedly dissuade certain witnesses uh, from testifying, uh, many of whom live in neighborhoods uh, that are the least advantaged financially and have the highest crime rates. So this is a big concern that our office has with this legislation. We can live with the logistics uh, if there is a solution to funding. But we cannot prosecute guilty, violent offenders without witnesses, period. To those who say, just get a protective order on sensitive cases, that's unproven on the scale that we are now going to enter in January of next year. Um, as we have, and, uh, and historically, we've been able to redact sensitive information. But here's the challenge and why this is not just uh, creating a false straw man. Uh, we've had a recent homicide cases where defense counsel uh, violated protective orders and turned protected information over to defendants, which turned out to be a grave risk to the safety of witnesses. In one case, the family of a homicide defendant was allowed to photograph documents with witness statements and information. That information was photocopied and plastered all over the NYCHA complexes where the defendant and witnesses lived. The witnesses then refused to testify about the murder. The jury was deadlocked. Now, there are many other issues uh, related to discovery and these issues which we've outlined in our written materials. Uh, I thank you uh, and the committee for giving us the opportunity to speak about uh, changes that really are substantive and, and most of all, uh, need to, I believe, be funded. That was four minutes and 30 seconds. It can be done. <coughs>
Yeah. It can be done. The clock will be starting at the beginning. Right. <laughs> I'm taking his, I'm, I'm taking the 30 that he didn't use. Judge, Judge mm -hmm. Clark. How are you? Thank you, um, Chairman Lansman um, and uh, Council Member Cohen from the Bronx, of course. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. For being here. apologize. Let me just mention also we've been joined by council members um, Alan Maisel and Brad Lander from Brooklyn. And the other council members of the committee, thank you also for being here. I'm sorry. Um, thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak here. Um, I return to you today to reiterate some of my budget requests in light of the new criminal justice reforms that will become law in New York State in January. Even before the legislation was conceived, I had been working in the Bronx since 2016 to bring trials, um, to bring cases to trial more quickly, reduce or eliminate bail, and to provide discovery in our misdemeanor cases. I'm proud to have played a role in that and that I hope I provided some insight to the lawmakers. I and my fellow DAs did beseech the legislature to proceed with caution concerning some of the aspects of the reforms that affect public safety. Regarding discovery, we believe that prosecutors should be obligated to disclose materials in their possession as soon as possible if the disclosure of these materials would not put a victim or witness at risk. But prosecutors should not be required to disclose the addresses or other personal contact information of victims and witnesses without their consent. We believe we should end cash bail, but there must be a meaningful detention option for those who pose a physical safety threat to others. We voiced our concerns to the legislature and to the governor. We did not get everything we hoped for in the new law. But as our job as prosecutors is to enforce the law, and we are moving forward to implementing these reforms. The funding request I made to this committee in March to help update our antiquated computer system for witness security and for resources to handle enormous amounts of body-worn camera footage has become more vital in the wake of the passage of the new laws, specifically because, according to the new law, all discovery must be provided within 15 calendar days of arraignments. We in the Bronx need cutting edge technology, a new case management system to ensure accountability, improve transparency, and provide efficiency and technology to provide documents and videos and other discovery quickly. The new case management systems that we have researched can provide great sharing capability between my office, law enforcement, the defense bar, the courts, the city council, and Mock J. I recently met with new NYPD De Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Ernest Hart, and we agreed this is crucial, especially since with the new law, prosecutors are now the custodian of NYPD paperwork and video. A state-of-the-art system will allow us to accurately track cases and individuals. Currently, we have no way to file electronic discovery, and our storage and email systems are overwhelmed. I have a capital requested for $2 million for the, a new case management system and $650,000 for maintenance in the request that I made to you in March. Requiring ADAs to turn over discovery documents early will allow the defendant to learn the identities of witnesses and where they work and live. Disclosing witness information will mean we will seek protective orders in many more cases than we currently do. This will result in more hearings and significantly more man hours redacting documents and videos. It also means we need enhanced security, along with compassion and support for our victims and witnesses so they will feel confident when they courageously agree to testify or cooperate in prosecution. Last year, I implemented a witness security program to help respond to this changing landscapes and enhance services for victims and witnesses. Witnesses, victims, and family members who were intimidated and cooperators in cases were assisted in relocation to temporary or permanent housing and required other expenses. So I would like to renew our request for funding for 10 detective investigators, $610,000, to provide witness security for those who are under threat. The statute actually prohibits the taking of pleas if discovery has not been turned over. We anticipate needing staff in the complaint room to copy and redact whatever discovery is available at the complaint room phase, that is the 61s, photos, vouchers, et cetera, for an initial turnover. 
Subsequent to the complaint rule phase, we will require personnel to more quickly retrieve and download surveillance footage, make redactions to body-worn camera footage and other surveillance, and redact paper discovery. TPAs will also be in constant contact with local precincts, the lab for narcotics, the ballistics labs, the office of the medical examiner for DNA and et cetera, and hospitals to secure, copy, redact, and turn over key relevant discovery within the window set by the statute. I'm, I'm almost done. We are estimating as many as 25 additional TPAs who will serve as discovery expediters. As far as ending cash bail, I suggest the city provide more funding for pre-trial services for those defendants who will remain at liberty but need resources in between arraignment and trial. For example, the supervised release, drug treatment, mental health services, housing, public transportation, and notices about court. Also, we have to depend on NYPD warrant officers to find the defendants who are automatically released but who may not return voluntarily, which will increase the workload for the police. I'm particularly concerned about the alleged drug traffickers who have no ties to the Bronx, especially in light of the opioid epidemic that we have in the Bronx. In conclusion, no matter how willing we are to carry out these reforms, we will not be able to do it without additional resources. After we have come this far to change the system, to make it fairer for everyone who must be a part of it, we cannot let money stand in the way of correctly, carefully, and efficiently implementing reforms whose effect will be immeasurable and priceless. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Lansman uh, and Council Members Cohen and Lander and Mizell. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to testify before you this afternoon. I also always have to give a shout out to the Staten Island Council Delegation Minority Leader Matteo, uh, Council Member Rose and Borelli for their continued advocacy on behalf of the people of Staten Island and New York City. It is no secret that I have serious concerns about the impacts, both intended and unintended, that the recently passed package of reforms to our state's criminal justice system will have on the people of Staten Island, New York City, and New York State. While I believe that the legislators, perhaps who champion these reforms, along with Governor Cuomo, were doing what they believe to be right, it is abundantly clear that Albany's fundamentally flawed legislative and budget process, combined with the poisonous impacts of our hyper-partisan politics, and a race to claim the crown of most progressive social justice reformer has left us with a package of legislation that will make every New Yorker and Staten Islander less safe. To be sure, it will be the victims of crime, yes, the victims of crime, who we should talk about, I think, more often than we do, the men and women of the law enforcement community and the innocent people of New York left suffering the consequences of these irresponsible uh, policies. But you know, unlike Albany, I want to thank you for at least uh, inviting us to come and talk about these issues because we were not invited to speak in Albany. A one-sided package was presented to legislatures and in the dark of night it was passed without any input uh, from those uh, who uh, lead the prosecutions throughout this state. So at least here, our voices will be heard. I hope that some of the things we say will be heeded. The impacts of bail reform will be felt across the system, but perhaps most acutely in the major narcotics cases. This at a time when every day a Staten Islander overdoses, and every third day that overdose is fatal. I wish people would spend more time talking about that. And since nonviolent felonies are excluded from eligibility of a bail request, I defer to my colleague, Special Narcotics uh, Prosecutor Bridget Brennan, to illuminate that issue a little bit more. With respect to discovery reform, this is where the most serious lack of compassion for victims of crime was shown by the legislature and the governor. Some of the most troubling provisions include that every witness to a crime and every victim of a crime will now have their name and contact information disclosed to the defense and can also be interviewed by the defense. Additionally, the defense may now move for a court order to access a crime scene, access a crime scene or other premises, including a victim or witness's home. Oh, I know we can move for a protective order, but how quickly will an already overburdened court respond to that additional motion practice? 
It is, and it is hard to imagine a victim of a crime willing to move forward with the prosecution of a criminal case while at the same time being forced to comply with these dangerous measures. Not only do these provisions threaten the safety of victims and witnesses, significantly more time, resources, and most importantly funding will be required to ensure their safety throughout the criminal justice process. Something Albany, shocker, newsflash, did not commit to our offices or any other offices in the city or in the state. And that leaves it to the city council and our own ingenuity to determine, to determine how to best comply with our obligations under the new law, a situation that will leave us scrambling and not able to serve the people we represent to the best of our ability. And again, with the respect to speedy trial reform, we recognize and share the legislature's goal of unburdening the system and moving cases more expeditiously through the criminal justice system. However, again, the adequate resources were not provided, not the court personnel, the court staff, the security staff, the staff in our offices, the staff for legal services and the public defenders, none of that was provided by Albany. And this will only be compounded by the increased reliance on desk appearance tickets, which again, I have no problem with, but the uh, amount of increased staff necessary uh, will be exponential as those uh, instruments are used uh, to charge people. I have to mention quickly the elder parole bill that is now being mentioned uh, uh, in uh, being discussed in Albany as well. I've been quoted uh, to say that it is outrageous and idiotic, and I stand by that quote. Again, while we fundamentally disagree with much of what was passed, or I speak for myself, was passed as part of these reforms to our criminal justice system, it appears that this will be the law of the land. And uh, Mr. Chairman, when you speak about bringing those uh, kicking and screaming, I think you said, to the table of reform, we're not kicking and screaming about reforms that need to be made in our criminal justice system. In fact, those of us at this table have been leading that charge with diversion programs that we've done on our own, uh, with interventions, with uh, prevention programs, uh, all those things, with victim advocacy programs, all those things we've been done on our own. Uh, we're not kicking and screaming, but when a, a, a legislative or reform process is one-sided like this one has been up until now, the result will be a disaster and calamity for the public, and that's what I hope that this council will consider as you look at the budget requests that we have made that will allow us to implement these um, uh, reforms. Uh, 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 Judge uh, Clark outlined those in her uh, request. We have the same in ours as well. And as you go through each one, you will see what it is we need to do this, not kicking and screaming, but to comply with the law. And it's also very important that it be done now in the budget process in June of 2019, because if it is deferred to a so-called November or January action, as we heard might be possible, we will not have that money to implement these uh, required mandates uh, on January 1st, 2020. Uh, so I submit the rest of my requests specifically uh, to the uh, personnel needed to implement the bail, discovery, speedy trial uh, uh, reforms. Uh, and again, thank you for at least giving us the opportunity to have our voices heard. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that is the reason why we insisted on having this hearing before we finish the budget process. We are here to try to ensure that the legislation that was passed, the laws that were passed, um, get implemented. But as I said, having sat there at one point, as you, re as you know, and I always, I always have to mention, I'm such a show off, but the administration will push back and say, well, we'll do this in a November plan, which never gets done in November, and it's incumbent and imperative that council say, no, we have to deal with these issues now. We've stood behind these reforms. We have to put our money where the mouth is, our mouth is because otherwise, we cannot meet these requirements as much as we are committed to doing so. We are on the same page. Mr. Gonzalez. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lanceman and the members of the justice system for the opportunity to testify regarding my office's implementation of the new bail, speedy trial, and discovery laws. This will no doubt be a huge undertaking for the city's district attorneys and the court system and we will need significant additional resources if we're going to implement these laws effectively and in the way that meets our collective goal of increasing fairness while keeping the public safe. 
I'll begin with the new discovery and speedy trial laws. My office has long practiced open file discovery in the vast majority of cases, which in addition to being fair to the defendant can also accelerate dispositions and reduce backlog. I believe this is just and fair, and I supported legislative reform measures that mirror this practice. The new discovery law requires us to turn over within 15 days of a defendant's arraignment the names and adequate contact information of anyone, not just witnesses testifying at trial, who has information that may be relevant to the case. As you can imagine, for a victim of a crime or a witness, being pulled into a criminal matter is anxiety provoking at best, and at worst, it could be a nightmare. We need a secure online portal through which the defense may contact witnesses in a matter that does not reveal their personal identifying information. The technology is currently available and could be used by all DA's offices in the city, but resources are needed to create and maintain that system. In addition to victim and witness safety, I'm concerned about the discovery law's timing requirements and how it will impact the day-to-day -day operations of my office. The new law requires us to turn over to the defense discoverable materials within 15 days after arraignment on all cases. As I noted earlier, the Brooklyn DA's office has practiced early in open file discovery for many years. Our policy is to turn over what we have when we have it and to have a continuing obligation to get it and disclose it as it becomes available. Our ADAs are trained in this practice, but early in our current practice, while it's well before trial, is not within 15 days after criminal court arraignment. Typically in felony cases, it's after a judge finds the grand jury presentation to be sufficient, and in non-felony cases is after the complaint has been converted uh, to a corroborated charging document. Under the new law, we will be required to provide discovery in cases that we currently end up dismissing or pleading out. This means that we will be required to provide discovery in thousands of more cases than we currently do under existing practices, which will require many more resources and assistant district attorneys if we're gonna be able to meet the requirements of the new law. In addition to legal staff, we're gonna need trial prep assistants, paralegals, messengers to track down paperwork and lab results from NYPD, OCME, hospitals, and other third parties. More tech experts to download, process, and review hundreds of hours of electronic recordings, including body-worn cameras, and more investigators to review documents and other materials. Improving our technology infrastructure and capabilities will also play an essential role. Securing, tracking, and turning over discovery material in the volume contemplated by the new laws will require additional tech capacity, both software and hardware. These additional staffing and technology needs are absolutely critical for my office's ability to comply with the new discovery and speedy trial laws. Regarding the bail statute, I supported reform because I believe that when someone is in jail pen, pending trial, they should not be there based on how much money they have. As with discovery, one of my top priorities in implementing the new bail law is to ensure the safety of victims and witnesses and the public at large. The legislation does not allow the court to consider physical threats to public safety when setting bail, including in many of our domestic violence cases, even though they often pose very serious safety concerns to victims. It's imperative that programming and pretrial services be developed and funded to deal with these defendants in these types of cases and the threats they pose to their victims. Another issue that we have to deal with under the new bail statute is that after January 1st, we will no longer be able to ask the court to set bail or order pretrial detention of defendants charged with sophisticated high dollar um, financial frauds. Even if the defendant is a foreign national or even if they demonstrate a willingness and capacity to flee the jurisdiction. These defendants are not served by the current supervised release programs, so we will need to develop and fund uh, programming for them, including electronic monitoring. Um, electronic monitoring is very expensive and currently we have no capacity in this regard. We simply don't use it except in a handful of cases. As with all other conditions of release under the statute, the cost of electronic monitoring may not be imposed on defendants even if they're wealthy. 
While legislators supporting the new bail law frequently point to electronic monitoring as available to, it's currently not routinely available, and we did not provide any funding to do that. Um, I know my time is up. Uh, what I will say is I have all the willingness to fulfill the obligations of these bills. We have needs, but I have to express some frustration because when the mayor's budget came out last month, none of the additional resources my office said we needed just to do our job were met, including things like renewing our lease for the building, an 1,100 person uh, agency, we're without a lease. Our warehouse has not been funded and we did not get the staff we needed to move to vertical prosecution. So I thank the members of this city council. I know your allies on you know, for me and for, and for the people of, for my county, but I'm, going to, I'm here to tell you that these reforms are at serious jeopardy if resources are not provided. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Good Ryan. afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the chair and the other members of the uh, committee and the council for the, uh, on behalf of the DA's office and the Brown family for the many kind words of condolences that we've received regarding Judge Brown. Judge Brown was a great district attorney and a great man, and we will all miss his wisdom, and I believe we will miss him more and more as time goes on. I thank the chair and the members of the committee for this opportunity to address you on behalf of uh, our office regarding the implementation of the new bail and discovery legislation that will take effect on January 1st. Taking just for example at the beginning, uh, I echo the concerns of our, uh, my colleagues regarding the logistical issues involved. Looking just at body-worn cameras for one week in April, uh, there were 553 arrests with body camera footage, and they averaged about an hour of video footage for each, each case. Uh, that means every one of those videos has to be go through, going through and reviewed prior to being turned over to ascertain whether any audio or video portions have to be redacted prior to being given to the defense. Once that determination is made, additional hours will be spent uh, filing motions for protective orders to redact the materials to obscure victims' faces, voices, and addresses. Once that motion is decided, we have to spend the additional hours actually reviewing and redacting material. The same procedure must be followed for 9-11 tapes and radio runs, which in some cases can also run for hours. The new discovery procedures will especially impact our office as we have in the past, at least, disposed of approximately 70% of our felony cases pre-indictment prior to the time current statutory and discovery obligations come into play. It will require a massive retooling of our discovery procedures, requiring us to process all these materials on cases which have, would have, in the normal course of things, have been disposed of pre-arraignment. By the way, I add after a uh, conference with Defense Counsel. We have for many years turned over early discovery on a misdemeanor criminal cases. We already have a process available in criminal court where we send defense attorneys a link that is available for attorneys to view and download body-worn camera uh, videos uh, using a do-it system. They are available for two weeks, a two-week period. before They have to be opened and downloaded within that two weeks. After complaints from the management at Legal Aid Society that two weeks was not enough time for their attorneys to open their emails, we extended it to a month, the maximum time the do-it system allows. Under the new statute, we are given 15 days to obtain, review, and redact materials that legal aid can't open even in a two-week time period. We will work it out, but it is going to require a substantial allocation of resources and equipment that we are just beginning to appreciate. The mayor's office has been very helpful in getting this conversation started, and we appreciate that. We're still in the process of assessing what our budgetary impact uh, of this legislation will be on our office, and I'll shorten that in the interest of time. Uh, it's going to involve IT-related personnel and hardware and storage uh, 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 devices. It's going to advise the need for more paralegals uh, to uh, go through and obtain the discovery material. Our current estimate, and it's just a, to say it's a ballpark estimate, I would say it's a very big ballpark. Uh, we're estimating approximately a million and a half dollars as a starting point to start this process. But there are other issues with the new discovery statute that go beyond the cost in terms of dollars and create additional problems. The first is the contact information that we are required to give defense counsel for witnesses. We realize that protective orders are available, but how do you explain to a, a court that a witness in the Ravens, Ravenswood houses who viewed a gang shooting is afraid to have her name revealed to the defense? How do you put that reason for fear in the motion? What about a homicide a witness in an insular community, community like the Rockaways? How do we protect them once their identity becomes known even before the grand jury is met? Why would they come forward once they know that the defendant will know who they are? They have lost the security of plausible de deniability. I have some nice hypotheticals here about burglaries, but before I, I got to them, 
I was handed a real case from Queens, and I think real is always better than hypothetical. We had a defendant last week that was charged with six residential burglaries. He has five burglary convictions, including in his total convictions. He has three violent felony convictions and three nonviolent felony convictions. He's a mandatory persistent violent felony offender. Uh, and he's got six current uh, residential burglaries. He is in jail right now, but on January 1st, unless somebody knows a part of the law that I don't know, unless he's at least convicted, and according to some readings of the law, perhaps sentenced, on January 1st, he walks out of Rikers. I do not think that uh, supervised release he's a proper candidate for. And that's what we, we're going to face come January 1st in, in, with that and other defendants as well. Uh, how do we tell burglary complainants that the defendant may have the right to come into their house with an investigator and take pictures? Do we advise them that before or after, be, do we advise them of that before or after they sign the complaint? Do we provide them with an attorney to contest the defendant's motion or advise them to hire one of their own? Uh, the law requires prosecutors to establish probable cause to obtain a search warrant to search a defendant's house. What is the standard to inspect a complainant's house? How could it possibly be that the, uh, there's less is required to get the, into the defendant's home than to get into the, uh, the, the victim's home? Okay, I'll move as fast as I can. When we tell witnesses that we have to provide contact, contact information for them to the defendant's attorney, do we advise them that they have a right to remain silent? If they have a child, do we advise them the child has a right not to speak to the defense? How do we tell a random robbery victim attacked and robbed on a train by strangers that his grand jury testimony is no longer secret and that we will be turning it over to the defendant as soon as we type it up? These are all very legitimate issues dealing with the implementation of these laws that are going to affect our very ability to prosecute these cases. We're not talking here about police reports or calibration tests. We are talking about substantially disrupting the lives of some of our most vulnerable citizens. How do we protect the people in high crime areas from the criminals who prey upon them? In almost every case, their identity will be known so quickly. What did these victims do to be treated with such indifference? Don't they have rights too? While they still have rights, those rights are unquestionably diminished. The hardest part of a prosecutor's job is to convince the victims that it is, it is safe to come forward and that it is a sacrifice that they must make for the benefit of their community and that we will protect them. The last possible moment now could be as soon as 15 days after an arrest. It will have re serious repercussions on our ability to prosecute crime in Queens County. We will have to deal with these issues because it will be the law. Judge Brown taught us that we have to abide by the law even if we disagree with it, and that is what we will do. We choose not to be silent at this critical moment. However well-intentioned this legislation may have been in the eyes of the sponsors, it was not well thought out. We believe that there will be serious long-term consequences to public safety, and this may signal the end of the area when crime, when crime only goes down. We hope that we are wrong, but we fear that we are right. Thank you. Ms. Brennan. Thank you very much. Uh, I ask that my written testimony be made part of the record particularly the budgetary requirements that we will have to meet this, uh, these obligations, these new obligations, because I would like to spend my time talking about the specific uh, change in the law which will have a huge impact on our ability to prosecute high-level narcotics traffickers in New York City. Well, uh, before, you, before you do that, and we'll stop your clock, right? It's your five minutes, you can say what you think we you. need to hear. Um, but relitigating the decisions that were made in Albany are less valuable perhaps in this form than talking about the things that the council can do to support your implementation of the law in the ways that you think are appropriate. I appreciate but that, but I believe that minutes. the council could assist me in endorsing the chapter amendment which I have attached to my testimony. Oh. And I have been to speak to uh, representatives of the council in support of this particular chapter amendment. Okay. Okay. Can we just put the five minutes back and then we'll go? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's wide support for many of the things that were incorporated in this legislation. But as some of the, my colleagues have mentioned, uh, it was enacted hur hurriedly with input from not all sectors of the criminal justice system, and the result is flawed and needs some fixing. And I think there's one section which could have a quick and easy fix, and that's why I have appended to my testimony a chapter amendment, which would allow for bail to be set in all A-level narcotics felony cases. Uh, because narcotics are categorized as nonviolent felony offenses. As it stands now, our highest level narcotics traffickers are not going to be allowed to get bail. 
or remand when they come before a court. Uh, there's only one very uh, seldom used section called Operating a Major Trafficking Offense 22077, where narcotics offenders are allowed to have bail set. Otherwise, a judge must release them from the courtroom. This package of reform has been publicized as benefiting low-level nonviolent offenders. So New Yorkers, I think, will be shocked and dismayed come January 1st when they wake up and discover that bail reform is not limited to low-level nonviolent offenders. State legislators have mandated the post-arrest release of defendants charged with top narcotic crimes with no possibility of a judge setting bail. I am sure that that was not intended by the legislators, that it was simply an oversight. Why do I say that? Because they did allow for bail in the major trafficker charge. And I believe they intended that major traffickers would face the prospect of bail or detention. But in narcotics cases, unless a defendant faces a single seldom charged offense, we charged it four times last year and seized 1,500 pounds of narcotics, heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine. But unless that seldom charge offense is charged, the new law requires judges to treat cartel associates the same way as low-level street dealers when it comes to bail. I believe that the legislation was intended to prevent pretrial detention of low-level drug sellers, but not of major importers of heroin and fentanyl in the midst of an opioid crisis. But those intentions were not translated into law. And after January 1st, as I said, a just judge must release all those defendants. This is true even in cases where many pounds of heroin and fentanyl worth millions of dollars were recovered, and meanwhile, drug overdoses are killing thousands of New Yorkers every year far more than all violent crimes combined. Those who stand to benefit from the new bail statute include members of foreign cartels sent to oversee million dollar narcotics transactions, operators of large scale drug packaging mills that churn out tens of thousands of doses of heroin and fentanyl, dealers who deliberately sell laced narcotics despite knowing that customers may overdose and die, and doctors who fuel addiction by illegally exchanging prescriptions for cash. Because New York City is a major hub of narcotics importation and distribution, surrounding states will also feel the impact of this change. Our investigations have resulted in the seizure of nearly four tons of narcotics in the past five years. Yet the office charged fewer than two dozen defendants under the major narcotics statute during that time. The majority of defendants in those serious uh, cases were charged as A-level felony. Uh, the difference between a narcotics possession charge and a major trafficking charge is that with the major trafficking charge, you have to allege the specific role of a defendant within a narcotics operation. And when we have confidential information or we are working on a wiretap information and discover a large load of narcotics, we must move in and seize those drugs regardless of what we know about the specific role that a defendant is playing with regard to those drugs. And so at that point in time, we usually are in, able to charge them only with the possession of those drugs. Uh, we had a case not long ago up in Harlem where we seized about 60 pounds of heroin and fentanyl. And those defendants, two of them, there was uh, $200,000 were in the room with the defendants when we moved in to make the arrest. They were only charged with um, the first degree possession of a narcotic drug. That's because we didn't have information at that point in time to charge them with operating as a major trafficker. And we may never be able to develop that level of information. Uh, that's, it's kind of a convoluted statute. That's why it's so seldom used. But as a result of this, we will see literally uh, hundreds of defendants walking out of the courtroom, many of them with foreign connections, many never to return to New York State. And I believe it will lead to uh, more drugs moving through our city, which is already recognized as a major narcotics hub. And I believe we can affect a minor change in the law, which is consistent with what the governor had originally proposed. And I'm in the process of talking to legislators and uh, members of the governor's staff to discuss this because I do not believe from any conversation I have had that this was ever intended. So I ask that the council join me in this. That the, and I'm happy to answer more questions than I can possibly answer in this five minutes that I have. 
but I think it's very important to this city and important to the integrity of the reform, which is obviously intended not to benefit these kinds of offenders, but low-level, truly nonviolent offenders. And we don't need a rigid statutory structure, which, will, which is more like the Rockefeller drug laws than anything else in terms of eliminating a judge's discretion to do what is truly appropriate. So I ask for your support in this effort. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to get, uh, let me mention we have been joined by Council Member Eric Ulrich from Queens. Um, I want to get uh, to some specific budgetary questions, but there's certainly been a, a, a couple of recurring themes in your testimony. Um, one has to do with what you perceive to be the potential uh, risk to the safety of, of witnesses. Could e each of you who, who are willing um, tell us uh, what steps, in your view, need to be taken to protect witnesses and what funding th would, are you looking to from the city to, to help you to be able to implement those, those steps and measures? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have that specific number. We are right now our office, and I think in conjunction with the other prosecutor's offices, are really sitting down and trying to collectively come up with a, uh, a real sense of what the costs are going to be for discovery, uh, for the supervised release uh, requirements, as well as witness. But I will say this, it's going to be millions of dollars. Uh, and well, well, before you, you say that it's going to be millions of dollars, which I understand, what exactly are you going to do? I, I heard you or, or somebody mentioned um, a, a secure portal for for defense counsel to interview witnesses, which I guess would be pursuant to some protective order that, that only allowed them to communicate witnesses. Like, what kind of mechanisms, techniques, um, practices do you feel need to be adopted in order to, to comply with the law and keep witnesses safe as you see it? And then we could talk about, well, what that might cost. I actually can't give you a dollar measure on that. But I, Let's I put aside the dollar part. Just tell me what things you need to do differently today or more of, I or will we have to do on January 1st? To have more options for witness housing uh, and relocation. Okay, so witness housing and reloc relocation, for example, okay. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, I would say that is, that, is, that is our biggest concern. Judge? For me, I asked for $610,000 for more detective investigators because I have a witness security program now because even before this legislation started, I had witnesses that have been threatened um, in court, outside of court, on social media, their personal information out there, and they become afraid to continue to cooperate. If they don't cooperate, we don't get to prosecute these cases and the city becomes less so, safe. So what would that $650,000 by. That would hire 10 more detective investigators that would help me be able to deal with the, the increase of what I anticipate being more intimidation of these witnesses because their information is going to be released within 15 days. We could ask for the protective order, but as a former judge, I could tell you, not always guaranteed. Okay. Depends on the judge. And so therefore, I have to make sure that I can keep my witnesses and victims safe. And when you say detectives or, or the, this staff, these are, these are personnel that would stay with witnesses and protect them, or they would investigate claims they, of intimidation? There will not threats. only be investigation, but also physically be with them to and from court, um, you know, making sure they get to court, um, housing them somewhere else, unless there's funding for us to actually place them somewhere else. I've used my own funds even to do that. And that's, you know, that is not really available, depending on how many cases. I have a huge trial going on right now, the junior trial. Expensive to make sure that those witnesses are safe, but that's, that's just one case that's costing a lot of money. With this new discovery, there's going to be a whole lot more people, unless they just choose not to cooperate, and then it's just still going to be less safe for the people of the Bronx because these people will be able to continue to commit these crimes. Uh, Mr. I, I would, I would uh, second that request in terms of uh, detective investigators. Those are 
uh, law peace officers who work in our offices, and really the, one of their main functions is to identify and then protect and, and make witnesses available. That's part of what they do now. So that they would continue to do that, but at much higher level. So we've also requested uh, six of those at a cost of $280,000. Um, if there's a question of witness tampering and reaches to that level, of course, that would be turned over to the NYPD uh, detectives to handle as well. But we also need the physical infrastructure uh, to meet the mandates of the law to conduct uh, video interviews with the defense. And so we would we have a request for secured rooms uh, and the uh, IT capability and people who can run it so that we can do that video conferencing that is re will be required under the law and a way for us to meet our mandate. Right now, we cannot do that. We do not have the ability to do that. And so uh, we have a request uh, uh, for that uh, as well about um, uh, the, to be provided the number, but we'll have capital requests for that as well. We're going to have to build out that infrastructure. Anything? Yes. Uh, so I was the one who mentioned the online portal. We had a company come in and make a presentation to, in my office and many of the uh, district attorney's offices that are here today uh, went to see that presentation. It sort of works in the sense that the victim's information is added into the system and there's a number provided to the defense attorney. The defense attorney can connect with the actual victim and witnesses in the case without having direct uh, identifying information about a person's home address, um, personal cell phone. That seems to comply with the, the you know, what the law says sufficient contact information but allows the the victims to have some sem semblance of you know, security and privacy we don't have a a full number for that and what that would look like versus new york city versus new york state uh, but i think that it would be at, at the very least a something that we need to have in the city uh, two days ago we secured a conviction of two uh, blood gang members who uh, killed two innocent women uh, during a, a shooting. During the course of that trial, Councilman, uh, routinely um, there was intimidation happening in the hallways of the courthouse and I came in, took pictures of witnesses on the witness stand. At some point there were about 25 fellow gang members wearing gang clothing in the courtroom, um, fully intimidating witnesses to the extent one witness did not want to testify any further was already on the stand and just shut down. Um, so this is a real issue for us um, and protecting witnesses and guaranteeing that we will protect them um, in the beginning of the case, through the middle of the case, and at the end of the case and after the case is over is a big part of it. And I think um, this has to be funded. And we will get numbers to, to you. I mean, the best, the the best way to protect a witness is to protect their identity. Uh, two days ago in Queens, we had a, a man try and steal a three-year, kidnap a three-year-old baby out of a baby carriage. Uh, was encountered by the mother and other people on the block. He fled across the street into a woman's house and encountered the occupant, uh, caused injury to her, and then was arrested. We offered both the parents of the child and the woman whose house was burglarized an order of protection. When they found out that meant the defendant would be given their name, uh, and their address to stay away from, they both declined an order of protection. The biggest protection for them is the defendant not to know who they are or their names and whatever. Uh, we run the risk of losing this under the statute. We went to the presentation at the Kings County DA's office. Uh, that is a step perhaps in the right direction, this portal. Uh, whether How effective it will be, I don't know. Uh, but uh, it is a, among the things we're going to have to try. We have done full-blown relocations in our office. There are very few witnesses willing to come forward for the privilege of having their identity changed and move to another location and leaving their lives behind them. It is a safety factor. It is not something that's appealing to most people. Again, what's appealing to most people is to protect their identity, and that's what we're going to struggle to do. I can't put a dollar impact on that. I don't think a dollar impact can be put on that. Obviously, we'll have uh, some of the same concerns, not specifically about victims, but about confidential informants uh, who are at great risk of harm. And it's not just the victims of crimes, but it is other witnesses. The statute is written very broadly, uh, referring to information relevant to the crime. So it's very, very broad. It isn't really just limited to what you might uh, offer as evidence in a case. So we will. Uh, 
because it's written so broadly too, it will, will require um, additional staff in terms of paralegal uh, staff to support the production of that kind of information. And uh, uh, in addition, we are gonna have some special needs uh, because so much of the work we do involves videos and undercover officers uh, and confidential informants, anybody like that, will have to be redacted from a video. So we're also looking for some specific software and IT materials, which are detailed in my testimony. We're looking for software for collecting, sending, sharing uh, electronic discovery. Um, we'll need to expand our internal storage capability for processing and storing uh, a lot of digital evidence, including videos. And that storage capacity is very expensive. So we're looking for an initial cost of $400,000 with regard to that and uh, recurring annual costs in addition to that. We'll need improved computer and media redactor software. Um, we have an anticipated cost of five power computers at approximately $100,000, and we're still in the process of pricing additional software. Um, we'll need more scanners and printers. That kind of uh, equipment will be necessary to effectively share the information that we'll need to share, so there's a cost to that. And we have to increase our internet bandwidth uh, for uploading and downloading discovery material with NYPD, so we're still in the process of pricing that out. Your five individual offices, um, we have the council, we have the mayor's office of criminal justice. It, it's my understanding that um, uh, between the, the, the six of you, you've created some kind of working group to kind of identify what your, what your needs are and be able to present them to the city. Is, is, is that correct? And if so, can you tell me what the status of that, that working group is? Or am I, am I misinformed and there's no such working group? Well, it, we've had a number of conferences among the, all the offices and also some with Mark Jay and some with Mark Jay and the NYPD. Uh, and we've all discussed ideas. Uh, I, I can't say that we're at the point where we've all sat down and said, okay, this is a, set, a proposal that will work for you know, all six offices. Uh, we are in discussion, uh, have a number of discussions with the PD. We have discussions yesterday that included OCA. We haven't talked about the DAT aspect of this today. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces in this, and we're all trying to figure out how to make it work. It dramatically changes something as simple as the DATs. Uh, you, I can tell you don't want me to get into that, but if I did, I oh, would. I, <laughs> if, if you're going to express your unhappiness with the legislation, that's, that's up no, to I'm, you. I'm, I'm, but I, what can no, we I can do to make it? I can explain yeah. to you one of the issues involved in DATs. Right now, we all have an allotment of how many DATs we can put on on a certain day, 50 or 100. If you, meet, if you meet that quota for that day, you move it to the next day, simple enough. Under the new law, the DAs have to be returnable within two weeks. That changes everything. Uh, that means we can't assume we can only put 50 on for a day because we don't know how many are coming in the next day. So the court system has to adapt to that, we have to adapt to that, and the PD has to adapt to that. Uh, these are ongoing discussions on vir virtually all aspects of this legislation. We are, will adapt are they, to it. Are, uh, are they ongoing? Like, is, is, is Mock J convening people regularly? Is OC, is everyone getting in a room? There you know, are, we, there are meetings all the time. There are conference calls all the time. I can't keep track of all the conference right. calls I've been on over the last few weeks. But I, I would suggest yeah. to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, that a, it would be constructive, I think, to have a more formalized uh, structure to this uh, uh, implementation uh, uh, challenge that the City of New York and, and the state uh, well, partners at OCA are going to face because it is somewhat, it's really sort of issue-based at this point right now. Uh, but I think in order for us to sort of buy into that, and not go in kicking and screaming. I think there needs to be a commitment from the administration uh, and from the state to say, look, we're gonna work on this for, for three months uh, and we're gonna agree to give you the resources that are, need to be done to get this and then let's have a target. We should not be tar targeting an implementation date of January 1st. For most of these uh, uh, mandates, we should be targeting an implementation date of October 1st and November 1st to make sure that we can get it right. Because yeah. we are gonna find all of a sudden things are gonna blow up because we think we're gonna adjourn uh, DATs and, and we find out we can't, we can go on and on. So from your chair, I think it's, it would be very helpful to advocate to the administration uh, and to Albany, let's have a formalized structure to see how 
uh, the jurisdiction that's going to have the most challenges in New York City is going to implement these, and I, I, we would certainly gladly be part of it. Again, right now it's sort of ad hoc uh, on different issues. Yeah, I will definitely, we will definitely ask Mark Jay about that. Lord knows they know how to convene a task force. Right. No, and and I was going to suggest that it's similar to the closed Rikers. Uh, implementation the same thing. That's Sticking exactly same what thing. we need. I think the problem that we dealing with here is leadership. Who is owning it and taking the lead? That's what needs to happen. And once that happens, we can convene everybody in a room, have a full working group, subgroups for different things, DATs, discovery, whatever, and come back and get it right. But we need leadership. Right. I'm, I'd be happy to do it, but it's not my my place to do that. Right. We have our role here is one piece of a very big picture. So I think it needs to come from the administration. Yeah. yeah. If, if Mark J does a lot of things, this is one thing that I think is really within their purview. Yeah. Uh, Councilman Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair Lansman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you know, just to try to get my head around the scope of uh, the issues around discovery, can you kind of uh, office by office give us a hint as to how often you make discovery now versus how often you contemplate making discovery after January 1st? Uh, Councilman, you know, for, for my office, you know, in our, in obviously it, uh, inventory is down tremendously over the last several years and number of new cases that come in. You know, historically the Brooklyn DA's office had over 100,000 cases a year, we're in the 70,000 mark, but a full 70% of those cases in criminal court are never resolved with any kind of conviction, um, and in those cases, often there's not full discovery. So we're talking about a 70% increase in what we would have to do in our criminal court, even with less cases, it's still tens of thousands of cases of discovery that would have to be completed that are not currently completed. In, in Manhattan, we typically dispose of an arraignment somewhere around 60% of the cases, uh, in the, um, historically. All those cases will be subject, unless there's a waiver from the defense, to full disclosure of discovery. Uh, it's, I don't say that to, be a, to make a roadblock, but the, the concept of full discovery early on is the one that has been, that's been put forth by the legislature and has now been passed there's a concomitant responsibility to fund it uh, so that we don't end up creating a system that fails, uh, fails for simply the inability to you know, obtain information, uh, reason, even with, with uh, every effort being made uh, on the volume of cases that we now have. And I think each case is different. For the most part, there's a, 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 you know, a bucket of cases where certain discovery can be done quicker than others. Those with complaining witnesses would take more, more uh, work. Those where police cases where they're not really confidential witnesses and things like that, discovery can be quicker. But it depends on what is required in the case. If it's DNA, it's going to take a little bit longer. If it's a wiretap, it's really going to take longer because those are thousands and thousands of pages of transcripts they have to go through. So it, it you know, it's a body of work. You know, and it, the timeline depends on the type of case. But now it doesn't matter. That's the reality of it. But now what it is is 15 days, regardless of the type of case. So, so the new laws don't take into consideration the varying types of cases and the amount of time that it takes to get certain discovery. And, and I think at this point, I have to remember, I can't, our office is not just, yet. Just use the mic, please, the mic. Uh, we're not able to say this is the setup that needs to happen because of this change in the law. You know, this is the, the 35 more people that we are gonna need uh, working just for discovery purposes alone. And, and we were, we're in the process of trying to get, develop real numbers by having tests in various trial boroughs uh, to determine really what the need, what, what is the need uh, based upon actual experience. And so uh, I don't want the committee to think that we are trying to duck the question, but this is, something that takes time to actually provide real numbers that are based upon experience uh, in test cases before we can come back and say this is, you know, this is a 50-person operation or this is a 100-person operation that we need funded for. Right. And I, I just want to add something that I know that all of you are aware of, but discovery is actually 
ultimately not controlled by the district attorneys, right? It's from our law enforcement partners and everyone else that we deal with, the, the city hospitals, OCME and all of that, and trying to get medical records from a public hospital within 15 days <coughs> on a misdemeanor case. You know, I, I just don't know who's going to pay for that, who's going to give the hospital the resources to do that. Um, well, those cases we'll never be able to announce ready for trial because we can't certify we completed our discovery unless we can get that material. And the same thing with OCME and so many other organizations. So when it's when we we're concerned about our ability to collect this information, it's because it's not in our custody, and so we're being asked to provide and copy and do all this stuff. But the, it's not in our. It's not just the police department. It's so much more than the police department. And even with the police department. You know, I have not heard anything that makes me very encouraged that they're, they're going to reassess their ability to get uh, all that material to the six district attorneys that they service um, within 15 days in all of their cases. And I, I just want to jump in real quick, quick if I could, Councilman Cohen. Um, when I, I came into office, because you asked how we do it now and what do we need to, to uh, reach the mandate or follow the mandate, when I came into office, I looked at how the other uh, four uh, offices, the five offices, did their discovery, and we implemented reforms in our office, early action disclosure. We call it, everybody has, whether it's called open file, whatever, because we don't like to take, give each other credit for the <laughs> names of the things that we do. But the basic idea is in felony cases, for sure, within 45 days, everything we have is turned over. And again, we have other obligations, remember, under Brady and Giglio, to turn things over. We don't hold things back. Uh, but the idea is that we've opened up our files and we turn everything over that we, we have to or that we think we should or, or, or may not even have to, but there is the reality of what we can do within a certain period of time. Now, I think within 15 days, we have to turn over grand jury minutes if, uh, if an appropriate case when possible. Okay, but who's going to provide the stenographer to, to, to transcribe that? That's, that's an incredible cost that I don't have the personnel. I mean, I have a trans... Uh, a stenographer in the, in the grand juries, but I don't have the ability to turn that over in 15 days. It's just one small example. If someone said, yes, uh, you know, on an ongoing rolling basis, like it happens in uh, uh, other areas of litigation, that would make sense. So we all have pretty open discovery uh, postures now, despite what is, is out there in the media, if you will, but you have to give us the ability to meet these new timelines. Otherwise, I don't know how we're going the system will collapse. I apologize for asking about the specific provisions of the law, but what happens if you don't comply? <laughs> we all know, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, are you, I'm asking, I guess, if you're precluded. Oh, I or think if we don't comply, the judge is empowered to uh, pr prohibit witnesses, preclude witnesses from testifying. Uh, and that's it, It's not automatic, though. It, it's, no, it's, upon it's, application. Not, it's not automatic. It would be an application by the defense. But the, the remedies are sort of the same as... Uh, intentionally not providing that information, uh, which is obviously what, just the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. If we don't comply, we can't answer ready. Right. I was, so that's these. what I was going to say. It, it ties directly to the speedy trial. And as a former judge, you know, I can tell you, it is, that part is still left up to the discretion of the judge. So we're going to have different, you know, findings in different counties and, or even in the same county. One judge may think, well, this is in compliance, and another judge may disagree. That's not in compliance. So there's going to be room for inconsistencies all over the place. But that's the one area where it's left up to the discretion of the judge to determine what impact not complying will have, but since it's directly tied to speedy trial, then it might be that we're not ready and the case could be dismissed because of it. Uh, and uh, We're unable to take a plea if we haven't complied with discovery. No, so we still have to get the stenographer's grand jury minutes, even if a defendant has pled or wants to plead guilty or whatever. Well, someone mentioned a waiver. I, 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 That's kind of complicated, Jack. Do you want to explain that? The waiver has to be offered <laughs> by has to be offered by the defendant. A prosecutor can't make anything conditional. Uh, and so, if a defense, you know, if a defendant says, oh, I just want to waive all discovery and plead guilty, I think it can be done then. But that, those are the only, that's the only circumstance under which it can be done. That's my understanding. It, it, it sounds like the defense can offer us a plea 
and then we can accept as opposed to us offering them a plea. We can't condition a plea offer on them waiving discovery, but if I'm reading it correctly, they can make us an offer and we can accept. I could be wrong. It's, it, it's convoluted. Again, I, I apologize that I'm not clear on the practice. The protective order, is the protective order an ex parte application or is that? So yes, it's ex parte. All right. But the defense attorney has to be alerted that there has been an ex parte application. Right. Which to some defendants, some of the defendants I prosecute, triggers, I shouldn't use that word, suggests that there is somebody who's cooperating, which can put a witness in jeopardy. I think it's safe to assume that the courts will be required to deal with thousands more requests for protective orders mm -hmm. as, these, as these cases unfold, which is, of course, itself uh, a ongoing, reoccurring cost of detective personnel and, and everything goes along with, make, with an order of protection. Thank you, Chair. My last question of the district attorneys. Um, some of the, the, the legislation that was passed um, could be imp implemented earlier than January 1st. I understand some of the things that were passed, which we've spent most of our time talking about, require um, procedural changes, um, new mechanisms in the office, new, new technologies. Um, but any consideration, for example, to just applying the, the new bail statute, for example, um, in circumstances uh, th where it would be applicable well, I, as early? I, as I indicated, we are trying to test out uh, how this is going to work in practice with, you know, with trials within the office. And so I think we, we are hopeful that we will understand what is really needed, uh, and then I think we'll move as expeditiously as we can. But I do think January is, uh, we're going to need, I believe, all the time between now and January uh, to be ready to be operational under these rules in January. In, in Brooklyn, Councilman, we are uh, working on seeing how we can do that. One of the things that you know has, I think, delayed us is that currently there, there is no uh, pretrial services. Everything is, pre is predicated that the appropriate offenders who need supervision would have pretrial services. There's still um, nothing to be done with all domestic violence cases, for example. They're trying to figure out a supervised release program for domestic violence offenders. Um, so even in some of the, what you would think would be simpler type of cases, misdemeanors, there's still concern about uh, the services being built out. Um, who's gonna build them? You know, is that going to be a responsibility of OCA? Um, and, you know, as I've been told, um, you know, there's nothing really in, in the immediate future and people are still scrambling for, you know, I've been asked to support various different organizations that they're looking for funding to build out programming and services. So um, I think we're eager in Brooklyn to start uh, beta testing what this would look like in many areas, but we need some of the supporting uh, programming around us to do that. I, th I think that's true with all of them. I would like to do it sooner too, but we have to test to see what is really needed, what we can do and what we cannot do. So we're going through the inventory, we're going through the work and seeing where, you know, where the effort needs to be in order to get this done. But, you know, if we can do it sooner, fine. If not, we're going to need until January 1st. But I think it's going to take a concerted effort of all of us and the other stakeholders to really see how we can make this work. So if I can just give you some numbers for Manhattan, which I think I hope will be illustrative. Uh, of the 9,500 9, people who had bail set on them from Manhattan cases in 2018, 71%, just over 6,000, fall into the mandatory release category. So 6,700 of that 9,100 would be uh, released and presumably would need the services that come from supervised release. Uh, and in supervised release, uh, it served 1,040 people in Manhattan alone. It serves about 4,500 citywide, and the chairman knows about the origin of that program. And uh, what we're going to see, as I said, is we're, it's estimated at a minimum, I think we're going to have tens of thousands of supervised release cases in the upcoming year. And I, 
I can only scratch my head how, you, how one could pass laws, however well-intentioned, uh, without stepping up to the monetary requirements on a continuous funding stream in order to make it work. Uh, I, I just don't know how that happened. I would just say, you give me what I asked for in my su budget submission, Mr. Chairman, uh, in June, and uh, we will start these programs, including bail reform, before the end of the year. You know, actually, I, I'm a little dubious of that claim. I mean, just knowing how, the, you know, if, if you needed money for discovery, to, for dis to implement this discovery, to, 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 to spec a system, to decide what you want to do and how you want to do it, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of time, even if you get the money in, you know, in, in this budget right now, for, uh, you know, to acquire this stuff, uh, procurement. I mean, it seems to me that that is a, a incredibly tight, tight timeline if resources weren't in question, and you know, you, you know, who knows what the, how that will shape up. But I, I'm very, uh, I find again, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, I, that the will is there, but whether or not, you know, you know, based on, you know, a, there doesn't seem to be even a consensus of what the system will look like. Well, how 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 will we how will we get in compliance? The idea that we could appropriate the money, that you could decide what you how you want to spend the money, and actually acquire the equipment and hire the people by January 1st seems to me to be incredibly ambitious. I wish, uh, uh, Councilman, the, uh, the state legislature had called you as an expert witness and listened to you, and you're right. Uh, the, the time for implementation, even going in whole hog, if you will, will take time. However, there are some elements that we could commit to and start to. But I think what your, your question uh, shows is that you understand how complicated this is and how resources are needed to do it, from stenographers to paralegals to detective investigators, um, to, to be able to meet these requirements, we need that help. And we, I think, I hope you're understanding that we're all committing to do it at, as much as we can, but we can't do it with the current systems and personnel that we have in place. Council Member Cohen, all I can say is from your mouth to God's ears. That's what, we need somebody to understand that. Thank you for and, the question. And, and, addition, and additionally, I mean, I think all six offices are at different places in terms of capacity, you know, you know, DA Clark talked about the need for a, a, a data a management system. We uh, we have needs uh, in in hardware to do electronic uh, discovery, and so we're all at different places. It's not a lack of will of any of us. It's just we have different realities on the ground. Thank you all very much. Uh, next, we will hear from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice.
All right. Um, now we'll take testimony from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. If you could raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please proceed. I get, great, I get to start all over again. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Lanceman, members of this committee. I am Susan Summer, General Counsel to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. On behalf of the office, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Mache advises the mayor on criminal justice policy and is the mayor's representative to the courts, DAs, defenders, state criminal justice agency, advocates, and others. We design, deploy, and evaluate citywide strategies to increase safety, reduce unnecessary arrests and incarceration, improve fairness, and build strong neighborhoods that ensure enduring public safety. We appear before you today to discuss the opportunities presented by key criminal justice reforms, particularly relating to bail, and our office's leadership. Those key criminal justice reforms were enacted as part of the state's budget bill, which will take effect January 1, 2020. We wish to share with you some of the city's efforts to date to lead and facilitate implementation of these reforms. They are broad in scope and impact. These reforms enact significant changes throughout the pretrial process for persons accused of crimes in New York State. Under the new law, Cash bail and pretrial detention will remain available as options only for the most serious offenses, including sex offenses and most violent felonies. The new law requires expanded use of desk appearance tickets rather than custodial arrests for most misdemeanors and Class E felonies with certain exceptions. Unchanged is the mandate that all decisions regarding pretrial release or detention be based on consideration of an accused likelihood of return to court. The state budget bill also enacts important changes to the state's laws on criminal discovery, including new statutory timeline by which prosecutors and defense attorneys must meet their mutual disclosure obligations, as well as speedy trial reforms. The bail reform legislation can be expected to drive the city further on a path well underway. Already, New York City judges release on their own recognizance approximately 70% of the individuals who are arraigned. At the same time, New York has enviable appearance rates, with about 86% of indi individuals returning for all their court appearances. The recently enacted bail reforms can be expected to expand release, further reducing bail and detention. It can also be expected to increase use of alternatives that, as evidence and, of, and our city's own experience have shown, are highly effective at ensuring an accused's continued appearance in court. These options include court appearance reminders, supporting the community by not-for-profit agency, providing supervised release, and reasonable restrictions on travel. These reforms thus come against a backdrop of increasing safety and decreasing use of jail in our city, a product of the concerted effort of many individuals, organizations, and criminal justice partners throughout New York, including the Council. Today, more New Yorkers can learn, earn, and play more safely in their communities than they could five years ago, when this administration began developing and deploying some of its signature criminal justice initiatives, including those related to reducing the number of people held in pretrial detention. In this span, our city has achieved the lowest incarceration, incarceration rate of all large cities in the U.S., while remaining the safest. When Mayor Bill de Blasio's administration began, in January 2014, over 11,000 people were in the city's jails every day. Today, that number is in the range of 7,500, more than a 30% decline and the fewest number of incarcerated people since 1980. At the same time, serious crimes have fallen by 14%. By democratizing the development and deployment of our criminal justice initiatives, the city has maintained a careful balance between safety and fairness. The recent statewide criminal justice reforms have presented us with an opportunity to press forward yet further on these important fronts, building off the backbone of initiatives already well underway in New York. Mock J is working hard with our criminal justice partners to ensure the city is ready on January 1, 2020, when the new measures take effect. 
The city's work toward implementation of these new changes involves enhancing existing initiatives aimed at reducing unnecessary pretrial detention, as well as coordination of the efforts of multiple justice partners, including the courts, the police department, district attorney's offices, criminal defense providers, service providers, and advocates. Central to our efforts to respond to the new law's provision for non-monetary conditions for release is adapting and building off of supervised release, a nationally recognized model for community-based supervision of pretrial defendants spearheaded by our office and initially funded by the Manhattan District Attorney. Since its inception, the program has ser served over 12,000 people and in 2018 alone prevented over 4,500 people from being admitted to jail. New York courts will soon have at their disposal another important tool, an updated CJA release recommendation system to help judges assess who can be both released on their own recognizance and counted upon to return for their pretrial court appearances. This is an updated, state-of-the-art, data-based analytical technique to improve accuracy while avoiding the calcification of historical criminal justice inequities. Court of Appeals Chief Judge Janet DeFiore in her 2019 State of the Judiciary Address stated that one of the key purposes of this tool is to address disparate impacts on racial groups at this critical pretrial state, and noted that the new system will enable our judges to make fair, accurate, and responsible determinations to avoid unnecessary pretrial detention. The combination of these reforms can be expected to dramatically reduce our jail population. Indeed, we have updated already our borough-based jail plan to reflect an anticipated reduction in the jail census from 5,000 down to a population of 4,000. In addition to building a smaller system, we are also announced that we can complete construction of these four borough-based jails by 2026, 2026 ahead of schedule. In recent weeks, we have convened many, many meetings and discussions among our among our criminal justice partners to coordinate preparations for implementation of the new bail, discovery, and other reforms with extensive engagement, planning, and collaboration to come. We are also using our existing coordination bodies, including the Justice Implementation Task Force and Supervised Release Steering Committee, as additional forums in which to exchange ideas, share concerns, identify needs, and develop resources. We stand at a moment of tremendous opportunity and we readily accept our shared responsibility and our leadership and our responsibility to head the charge with our partners as we work to get it right. We thank the council for its attention to these issues and we also thank the New York State Legislature and Governor Cuomo for enacting these important criminal justice reforms. Thank you. So um, you were here, I believe, while the district attorneys were we're testifying, um, and they seem to indicate, without pointing any fingers, that there does not seem to be an organized effort to uh, have all the stakeholders and those responsible for implementing these new rules uh, sitting around the proverbial table and working it all out and figuring out which agency needs to do what and which way. and. Uh, how much money does the city need to kick in and, and, and how much money do we need to go hat in hand to the state for, if that's even realistic. Um, how has Mock J been working with the Office of Court Administration, the DAs, the Department of Correction, the, the, the public defenders, the NYPD, the, the district attorneys to, to make sure that the laws that were passed up in Albany actually happen, or, or is Mock J not assumed that role? M Mock J is very actively uh, taking leadership over the many complex parts of implementation of these new reforms. We have uh, convened meetings that are occurring uh, on virtually every day of the week with our different um, uh, partners, OCA, district attorneys, public defenders, office representatives, advocates, police department. We have convened meetings that uh, are across section and meetings with uh, the, the individual groups. I think we're very actively engaged in hearing from our partners what they perceive to be their needs and trying to come up with solutions. And we've also been meeting as well with experts and others uh, to try to plan so that we are as ready as we can possibly be January 1. I'll add that we also have been building off of 
a lot of work that has already been done in by our office and in partnership with uh, all these partners. So we start from a position where we already have, for example, model supervised release programs and are evaluating ways that we can build off of all these initiatives. Well, I mean, you were here. Am I mischaracterizing the district attorney's uh, testimony when they seem to indicate that they had was no central uh, dr driving uh, force or organization behind getting all these reforms uh, implemented and getting the DAs and presumably other agencies the resources that they need. I mean, that's what I heard from them. What, what would be the breakdown then, do you think, in, in the communication or, the, or this effort that the district attorneys don't see that level of, of organization and, and focus on the part of the, the administration? Well, I, I know that we have been engaged extensively with them and however, you know, whatever characterization one might offer, they also have reported that there have been multiple meetings that they are in the midst of uh, making determinations as to what their needs are. We are eagerly awaiting uh, all the information that we are actively trying to, with our partners, uh, gather and process. We are committed to uh, co our coordination and leadership on this issue. Uh, we could call it by, you know, whatever name we call it, we use our Justice Implementation Task Force, our Supervised Release Working Group, our regularly convened meetings. And uh, with six weeks in, we can now pick up the pace as we get more information in. We are definitely committed to leading the charge and being ready on January 1. Okay, because um, you know the budget passed, the state budget passed April 1st, and all these reforms, if I'm not mistaken, were, were shoved into the, into the budget, so it's been well, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it's, whatever it's been. Does, does Mock J yet have a, a, a blueprint for what all of the stakeholders in New York City have to do in order to be ready on January 1st? Here's what the DAs need to do, and here's what the police need to do, and here's what the Department of Corrections need to do, and whoever or whatever other agencies are involved. Is there some, some written roadmap that, that people are working off of? We are actively working on uh, gathering and being responsive as the first one of the first steps, what our partners uh, are identifying as their needs, while we point out as well uh, directions to go in. But we are right now in a very intensive engagement phase, learning uh, more about needs and uh, assessing the array of uh, supports that already ha we have in the city and can build off of. So let me ask, when we, when we shift from assessment to uh, a plan of action, and, and I'm gonna tie that to what was gonna be my next question, is um, I did not see anything in the mayor's executive budget that was towards implementing or ensuring that these new reforms are getting implemented. So when do we move from assessment to okay, here's what every agency needs to do. And if there wasn't anything in the executive budget, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, when are we gonna be told, okay, here's what all of this is gonna cost? Again, we are very actively involved in assessing what the costs might be in uh, working with our partners. We just heard from the district attorneys today that they themselves are uh, determining what they think costs could be. And uh, we are working on uh, evaluating what needs will be. This was not the only opportunity uh, to make determinations about what might be needed in terms of budget. Well, when do you expect to, to, to know or to determine, right? This thing's, the law kicks in on January 1st and we in the city don't have the ability and for what it's worth, I don't have the inclination, regardless, but don't have the ability to, to delay any of these reforms. So is there within Mach J, which is viewed by everyone, I think the council, the district attorneys as, as the, the, the pilot of this, this ship, is there a day where, okay, 
here's where we are going to determine what everyone has to do. And we're, we're done with the assessing. Here's the plan. Right. So we are, again, working very hard with uh, many, many partners in a complex process involving what is an historic criminal justice reform uh, unseen, I think, in the professional lives of in the prof years of professional practice for uh, many, many people who are involved in the system. Uh, we don't have a, 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 a specific date, but we are very aware that there is a specific date that Albany has uh, set for the city, and that's January 1, and we are committed to being ready on that day. Right. Well, let me ask you about another specific date, which I think is uh, June 30th, which is when our budget in the city has to get done. Is Mock J going to come to the council before that June 30th date and say, we have looked at what the NYPD needs to do and what the DAs need to do and the Department of Correction needs to do and everybody else needs to do, and here is what it will cost X millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. Are we going to have that? Do you, do you anticipate having that in this budget? I, I could not make a, a commitment or uh, set a timetable. What I can tell you is that we are, as you can hear today, uh, working on what is a, a very complicated multi-factor process that involves uh, the estimates and predictions of many partners, and we are gathering all that information very actively. And we, we do understand the uh, the great importance of what this means for the city, what this means for our partners, and of the looming January 1 deadline. Um, are you working with OCA? Are they part of this conversation, such as it is? I'm sorry, I- Are you working with OCA? The Office of Court Administration, are there, you're engaged with them on this? Absolutely, uh, I think not, you know, a day or two goes by without um, meeting and consultation with them. We are very actively engaged with them on this Do, process. You know, we asked them to come here uh, sparingly, so um, I'm gonna ask you if you know whether or not OCA is gonna uh, be adding any uh, DAT parts. You heard the district attorneys, I think one of the DAs mentioned a concern on the cap of number of you know, DATs that, that, that a court will hear in a given day, which now seems like it's not realistic. Do you know if what, what OCA is going to do to expand its capacity there? I can't speak for OCA, but I know that they are uh, working hard as well to evaluate what will be needed going forward, and they are engaged in discussion with uh, uh, the array of partners that we have been uh, telling you are part of the consultation process today. Mm. Well, let's talk about supervised release because it's at the center of a lot of what what hopes to be a, a achieved. Um, currently, v virtually all of the people who are going into the existing supervised release program will not be participating in supervised release. Correct that that those folks who are, are currently eligible for supervised release. Um, what, what do you anticipate will, will, the, will the, the, the bail reforms be on the current population of people who go into supervised release programs? Well, the, the new bail reform law does not necessarily uh, disqualify from supportive services or non-monetary conditions, the uh, kinds of individuals who are currently in supervised release, of course, that will be a determination squarely on the shoulders of the courts. The new bail reform law uh, makes judges responsible for making determinations regarding uh, release on recognizance or non-monetary conditions or for those eligible, um, something like bail or detention. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we need to expand the eligibility of supervised for supervised release, as you know, right now it's somewhat restrictive as to what level of offense a person is charged with that will make them eligible. I know there's a bail, there's a there's a pilot rather in in Brooklyn. Can you can you talk about the thinking of of making supervised release now uh, available to people who have committed or alleged to me alleged to have committed more serious offenses for whom cash bail is still, in my view, unfortunately, an opportunity. Uh, a possibility? 
So New York City uh, is in as strong a place as anywhere in the state, potentially anywhere in the nation, with a very strong supervised release program already. Uh, as you note, it is largely uh, for those who are not uh, people who have those kinds of felony convictions, although we are piloting a program and uh, are, are pleased that we have that underway. We very much recognize that the bail reform law means that a number of people that judges in the past may have been setting bail on um, and who may also have been detained will no longer be eligible for either. And the, clearly the, 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 the new law is driving towards um, non-monetary conditions or, or more ROR. And in the, what could be a very large and expanded bucket for non-monetary conditions, we are working very hard on evaluating um, what would be appropriate. And again, fortunately, we have a nationally recognized supervised release program. So we already have um, a lot of lessons learned that we will be building off of. Um, similar genre of supervised release, the district attorneys, several of them expressed uh, concern that um, people who now will be released on their own recognizance or, or some kind of supervision uh, who previously were going to be detained because they couldn't make bail, that there be uh, pretrial services and other programs available to that population. What is Makche's thoughts on that and, and what needs to be uh, built out or built up in order to uh, uh, provide those services to, to people which the district attorneys themselves thought were necessary to, to keep keep them safe and, and us safe while people are, are out waiting resolution of their case. So we are uh, he hearing extensively from them and uh, consulting with our own experts and others. Uh, we understand that pretrial services can be a very effective a tool and we are exploring options and um, responses. Do you have any thoughts on any of the different kinds of programs that might uh, be readily uh, uh, built up or expanded? Well, again, we, we are fortunate to have such a sort of strong backbone already in the city with a number of uh, really excellent providers and with programs already underway. So we uh, fortunately have a lot of expertise to draw on. Um, we are actively looking into what will be, uh, make most sense under the new, new reforms. Mm -hmm. Just to go back to, to Mach J's role in, in leading the effort to, to get all of this done, is there, is there a person at Mach J who is the, 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 the person who is the one responsible for shepherding uh, all of these uh, uh, different stakeholders towards, towards figuring out exactly what needs to get done and making sure it gets done? I, I hate to use the term uh, czar, but is there a, a state criminal justice reform implementation czar? Who's, who's overseeing this in Mach J? Well, this is uh, so important and such a large undertaking that uh, the, the, the work, you know, is, starts at the top with, of course, our director, Glazer, and a few of us are the uh, active uh, leaders of the charge. but. The work calls upon so many elements of the office that I can uh, say that we have enlisted a, a whole uh, number of us who are very actively working on this. All right. Let's talk about electronic monitoring. How do you um, foresee, what, what do you foresee the role of electronic monitoring to be in the new regime now that that's uh, very much on the table? So the, the new bail law, of course, uh, specifically provides reference to electronic monitoring as a potential option uh, under certain circumstances for judges. And um, it, we, we, we are looking at whether, you know, will judges be interested in that? There are a number of challenges, particularly in a city of New York City's density and uh, our sort of special uh, geography and ecosystem, for example, just even 
what happens if you're in the subway or in a high rise. Um, so understanding that there may be a number of shortcomings, we are uh, meeting with you know, experts and others to determine its efficacy and usefulness and what, will be, what may be available and how to uh, make it fit into a larger picture. We, of course, have for years been committed to reducing um, not only our jail population, but lightening the touch of the criminal justice system on individuals. So we're exploring uh, what can keep the city both safe, but also uh, promote fairness as well. Mm -hmm. I, I know that Mach Jay is always, or always, at least my time here, um, you know, has, I think, expressed sensitivity to concerns about over-monitoring people and setting people up for, for, for failure and, and then uh, greater problems in the criminal justice system. Uh, I, I assume that you're looking at electronic monitoring with that same mindset. Right? There's a tremendous amount of concern, as you know, that electronic monitoring will become the, the default, the go-to for judges who institutionally are concerned about being that judge ending up on the front page of the New York Post because they let out somebody who then did something terrible. So can you just, just reiterate what I understand to be Mach Jay's philosophy when it comes to these kind of things? Uh, thank you, Chairman. We, we certainly uh, appreciate your words on this subject and have been listening very hard to, to many others and understand uh, the concerns around electronic monitoring. We also understand you know, there are those who, including those who uh, represent and support individuals who have been involved in the criminal justice system who, system who might, um, under certain circumstances, feel that it's actually perhaps the most viable option. So we are at a phase right now of trying to um, assess the alternatives and be very, we are mindful of the principles that you articulated, absolutely. Okay. Just a couple more questions for me. Um, there is a new emphasis in the, the law uh, requiring the court to consider an individual's ability to pay in those circumstances where bail, cash bail, can still be set. As I'm sure you know, the council funded a program uh, run by Vera in the Bronx and Queens, which tries to inform the court of what a person can legitimately pay. Um, it seems to be successful from what we're hearing, um, but um, have you considered, as Mark Jay considering, uh, looking hard at whether or not uh, that program should be expanded beyond the pilot in just a couple of days a week in Brooklyn, in Bronx and Queens, to go citywide and, and, and perform that, that vital service? We are, we are looking at uh, the Vera model and the the what are now like the early results we've been looking at ways to help judges have the tools that uh, are most effective for them and that they need and also uh, consistent with defendants interests and defenders and and prosecutors as well so we are definitely exploring possibilities and can you just give us an update on the um, the risk assessment tool that CJA was working to update. We had understood that, that um, it was gonna be significantly changed. There was some, some conversations, some briefings. Then we heard that it's not gonna be significantly changed. Where are we on the, the CJA new risk assessment tool? So uh, the updated CJA release assessment tool is going to bring significant changes from the 2003 version that is currently in use. Uh, CJA with the team of experts that Mock J uh, supports after the new bail reform pass looked at uh, the the data and the the tool and met with some of our partners and it remains every bit as much if not more um, important now and we are still in the process, we, we, we've been piloting it in, in a uh, sort of qualitative approach, and we expect that it will be rolled out uh, in time to help be part of the implementation of the, um, 
new bail reform laws, and actually we think it's going to be a potentially incredibly useful tool that much more so even than before. All right. Sorry, one more and then I'll go to my colleagues. Um, the new DAT uh, procedures, do you know when the patrol guide is going to be updated and to, to inform officers of, of those, those processes? We've had um, more than a couple of circumstances where the police department has testified at a hearing that they're going to do X, Y, and Z, and months later the patrol guide hasn't been updated. Uh, we view this, this is a hard and fast January 1st deadline. This isn't merely a, a council request. So I hope that the patrol guide isn't going to be updated on December 31st, and then they're going to start training people. So can you tell us what that, what that rollout looks like for the NYPD? What I can tell you is that uh, NYPD is extremely mindful of uh, the responsibilities and changes that come with the new law, um, actively working on this. We have meetings regularly, um, including as recently as yesterday with uh, other partners, and they are actively working on uh, what will be needed to implement the new law and be, be ready. Councilmember Cohen, let me just mention we've been joined by Councilmember Debbie Rose from Staten Island. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I suspect the Chair may have asked this while I was out, but I did read your testimony. Uh, and I'm curious if you, uh, I, I thought the testimony of the DAs was uh, not overly optimistic in terms of being able to be ready on January 1st in terms of uh, discovery. I don't know what your assessment is and uh, uh, even there, uh, even what they need did not seem to me to be crystal clear in terms of being in a position to, to comply. I don't know if you have an assessment of that and if you have an assessment of needs, but if you could share. Well, that. Um, I, I, I love repeating myself, so I'm <laughs> all good with me. But um, I think as I testified earlier, uh, we have been actively working with the district attorney's offices and they have been actively assessing their needs. Um, we understand that January 1, was a deadline that uh, the state has given to New York City as well as uh, every other county municipality. It's an aggressive deadline, but we are working very hard to uh, help be ready to meet that. Um, so, you know, we, we, we understand that there's tremendous urgency here and are working with the district attorneys and I know they are working hard as well to get ready. Uh, but just with issues around procurement and hiring people, uh, and do you, uh, I mean, I guess at some point maybe we could check in again and find out where we're at, but it, it seems to me to be, I mean, maybe there could be some incremental progress on January 1st, but I can't see how suddenly they can go from not making discovery on 70% of the cases to making discovery on 70% of the cases. It's just the infrastructure doesn't seem to be there. So. You know, the, the circumstances for the district attorney's offices are, do vary some among the offices, um, but we are but very- even, even District Attorney Gonzalez, who I guess is, is leading the charge, did not seem to me, reading into his testimony, he didn't seem particularly optimistic that he would be in a place it, on January 1st. It, it, we, we have been given, um, the, the new criminal justice reforms, including the discovery reform, uh, pose great opportunities and also great challenges, and we are very mindful that the clock is running. Uh, so we are working really hard, and so are they, we know, in order to uh, get as much as, you know, to get everything in order for January 1. Is there a, like, a peace dividend? I mean, like, even for electronic monitoring, I, if it's some, I don't know what it costs to, to have somebody be electronically monitored, but I, I have to imagine it's substantially less than keeping someone on Rikers. Is, does, do you have the ability or your agency have the ability to sort of allocate, one is that in, in this reduction of the population at Rikers, which is something that everybody should be very proud of and it's substantial, I don't know if there's like a peace dividend, if there's been, if there's corrections has so much money they don't have to do it, <laughs> like, that we could allocate it to this, but is, is that something, is there a peace dividend here? Is there money to be moved around? Well, the. We are, we are evaluating what all the costs and benefits are and whether electronic monitoring uh, serves the functions that, uh, that one might 
want or think um, and what the costs are and the benefits of that are as well. So as well as what it means um, in, the, in the short term, you know, I don't think we can expect to see you know, the, all the peace dividends perhaps that, that uh, may lie further down the road. That will take some time to realize. Uh, have we, I mean, as, as the population has declined and de declined dramatically at Rikers, has operating Rikers become less expensive or? Uh, you know, we don't have, I, I didn't come today with, with actual like numbers or data, but as a general matter, uh, you know, there's still hard costs and infrastructure costs that aren't necessarily um, as sensitive. It's not like a one-to-one -one trade at all, at all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Council Member Rose, anything? No? Good. Um, just one second. All right, I am going to talk to the leadership of the council about the possibility of putting in a, a bill and getting it passed lickety split um, that creates some kind of task force or, or, or governing organizing body that is, is charged with, with owning the shepherding of um, all the various stakeholders who need to get things done to make this law effective and, and real on, on January 1st um, to, 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 to make that happen. And, and MockJ would be the natural, the expected organization. Um, I appreciate your testimony and, and I'm glad that we had this conversation. I, I want to leave you with my um, impression that, to, to continue the, uh, the metaphor, that the ship isn't, isn't really being piloted the way it, the way it should be. And um, that's not just me saying that. That was the district attorney saying it as well, or at least implying it strongly enough that, that I'm, I'm getting that sense. So please take that back to the powers that be. Um, and I really do look forward to working with you and everyone at MockJ to make sure that this law is fully implemented by January 1st. And if you get us some, some numbers, some budget numbers, um, we'd be more than happy to, to the extent that we can, advocate for getting the funding that is necessary, that's truly necessary, done in this, in this budget. If we end up waiting until November, I'm very concerned that, and we haven't heard from our friends in the public defender's offices yet, I'm very concerned that all of the, the organizations that have a tremendous amount of work to do to, to make this, this new law work, they're just not going to have the time to, to do it. Thank you. Uh, if I might respectfully say, I believe the work really is underway. Uh, we can call it by whatever name, a rose or... <laughs> Uh, whatever we wish to call it, but MACJ is in fact uh, at this stage has been convening what in effect is a is in effect a task force um, and working within the structure of some we already have. So uh, you know, a f m making it more formal today or for us as we've been contemplating making it more formal uh, shortly it doesn't really change our fundamental commitment uh, to take on this shared responsibility and to lead. So I appreciate so, that. I do. And, and, and I don't question your, your commitment. Um, I don't question anything. I'm just saying. We've had big ideas. Um, we, we've, the city has struggled with implementing significant criminal justice policy changes. Um, I don't think that anyone thought that the rollout of moving the um, juveniles off of Rikers was as smooth as it could be. I think the administration had not planned for who was going to be staffing Horizon. And that was kind of small and, and very easily defined compared, compared to this thing. So let's just try to do everything we can organizationally to, to get from here to there, which I know that you want to do. That's all. All right. Thank you, and we uh, look forward to this ongoing work, and we appreciate the council's partnership. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat>
Okay, now we will hear from um, various public defender organizations. Um, I understand they're representatives from Brooklyn Defender Services, New York County Defender Services, the Bronx Defenders, Legal Aid, and Brooklyn Defender Services. So come on down, please. Ready? All right, let's raise our right hand, get sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Um, let's set the clock at five minutes each with no requirement that you use the full five minutes, and, um, and we will begin. Good afternoon, my name is Young Mi Lee, and I'm a supervising attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services. I wanna thank you for uh, allowing us to testify today. Um, in my written testimony, I go into detail about the pretrial justice reforms enacted earlier this year, but today I want to focus my oral testimony on electronic monitoring, or what many are now calling electronic shackling. Uh, but first, I just want to pause um, to um, speak about how historic all of the, these reforms are in New York. Uh, many more of our clients will, will never have to set foot in jail again. Um, and it will be a vast departure from today's reality. And they will finally be statutorily entitled to all of the evidence in their cases, except in the rarest of circumstances, and that has to do with protective orders. Given the devastating impact that every 24, that even 24 hours in jail can have on a person, particularly a young person, or a person with a health condition, this changes, I'm sorry, this change exemplifies the major improvements to justice in New York and may likely save lives. While money bail was not eliminated entirely, the good, the goal and intent of maximizing decarceration and ROR is clearly evident. In cases where money bail is an option, judges must first consider ROR and then release with the least restrictive necessary conditions as the alternative. Um, the first is pretrial services, and the second is electronic monitoring. Implementation of electronic monitoring not only raises concerns about net widening, which is also true for pretrial services, and if we're talking about limited resources and funding, we have to be very concerned about net widening. But, but electronic monitoring also raises concerns that it can look like a jail sentence uh, in the form of house arrest, and that, can, and that it can also be used to unlawfully engage in surveillance which is obviously an invasion of privacy. We must keep in mind that electronic monitoring should not look like a, a post-conviction sentence. All people must be afforded the presumption of innocence. Information on electronic monitoring in the pretrial context is limited as other jurisdictions are beginning to use it as well in the pretrial services context. New Jersey's bail reform also allows for electronic monitoring, but its impact has not been fully analyzed. Electronic monitoring can take on two forms. Uh, the first is GPS tracking, and the second is radio frequency. Both forms can result in unnecessary technical violations based on faulty equipment and battery issues, and therefore result in re-incarceration or just plainly incarceration. 
Both forms also require wearing an ankle monitor that is obtrusive and noticeable. The visibility of these devices clearly have collateral implications, especially in the employment context. No one wants to go to work wearing, uh, obviously, um, a very noticeable ankle shackle and can bring shame and embarrassment. And this is true for those people who have had electronic monitoring imposed on them. The legislature restricted the use of electronic monitoring to only certain cases and prohibited any fees to people compelled to use it. Still, the risk of net widening and other harms remains serious. EM raises privacy concerns that have nothing to do with ensuring an individual's return to court. And I ask the City Council to seriously consider how uh, electronic monitoring must be used uh, in terms of uh, budgeting for the use of electronic monitoring. Uh, first, um, if GPS tracking uh, is used, it creates the potential for not just unlawful surveillance, but also unlawful data gathering. Um, there are two private companies, uh, for example, Antenti, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and Satellite Tracking, which have been known to have contracts that specify that data will be kept for several years, long past the termination of a criminal case. Um, it's clear that if electronic monitoring is going to be impl uh, implemented, uh, private companies will have to be used as they are the manufacturers and they also know how to maintain these, uh, the equipment. I urge the City Council that if GPS tracking is used for electronic monitoring, that uh, the City passes legislation to ensure absolute transparency and to ensure that data is not gathered where it can be kept indefinitely, including by any private corporations. Any records that are obtained should be destroyed after the termination of, uh, of the criminal proceeding. Radio frequency uh, electronic monitoring is otherwise known as curfew monitoring. And um, with the radio frequency monitoring, even though um, an ankle bracelet or an uh, ankle shackle has to be worn, um, it's, it's simply a device um, that's placed at the home, and as soon as the person returns home and they're within 50 to 150 feet, um, an alert is set off to the monitoring agency, which allows that agency to know that the person is remaining and it's still within the jurisdiction, which is what the legislative intent was. In short, electronic monitoring should only be used to ensure an individual's return to court and that he or she remains within the jurisdiction. Radio Radio frequency is sufficient to monitor that individual's compliance. Using radio frequency also has, has less potential for unlawful surveillance and data gathering. And it should clearly be used only in those cases where money bail or jail uh, is the alternative, which is, which is always the better option than Rikers. Um, and that's all I have to say about electronic monitoring. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Lansman, my name is Eli Northrup. I am Associate Special Counsel to the Criminal Defense Practice at the Bronx Defenders. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today about this important matter. My testimony today focuses on the implementation of the new bail statute. As we sit here today, far too many of our clients are held at Rikers Island or the Vernon C. Bain Center, otherwise known as the boat isolated from their families and support networks, unable to go to school, to work, provide for their families, make medical appointments. The overwhelming majority of people are there because they were arrested and cannot afford bail. People who are presumed innocent, placed under enormous pressure to plead guilty, simply to extricate themselves from these awful conditions. And I heard the testimony earlier of the DAs mentioning all the costs of these new reforms. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention the human and financial costs to our clients, their families, their communities that they've endured, which led to the necessity of these reforms. With the passage of this bail reform in Albany, we have an opportunity to radically rethink how pretrial detention and pretrial release operate. The new statute reflects greater fidelity to the presumption of innocence and makes clear that liberty must be the norm. Detention should be used sparingly, if at all, 
and we must seize this moment to make these goals a reality and reorient the city's resources and culture towards dramatic decarceration. We recommend that the city take the following steps. Eliminate charge-based eligibility restrictions for pretrial pre services. And Chairman Lansman, you mentioned this in your question earlier. Um, as of this past Sunday, 42% of the Rikers Island population consisted of people charged with violent felony offenses. That's 3,229 people awaiting trial, the majority of whom are incarcerated simply because they can't pay bail. As it currently stands, the city's supervised release program would not accept any of these individuals or anyone charged with any of the crimes that are eligible for money bail under the new statute. This means that if no changes are made to the supervised release program, the only people enrolled in it are people who are not eligible to be held in jail. Thus, supervised release would cease to act as an alternative to incarceration, which was the purpose for which it was created, and instead will only serve to widen the net of individuals under state supervision. This contravenes the primary goal of the new bail statute, which is decarceration. Thus, as a first step, the city must eliminate charge-based disqualifications for pretrial services programs. The city must also target pretrial service resources towards people charged with violent felony offenses. The emphasis should be on determining ways to release these individuals under non-monetary conditions. New York City has a chance to reimagine the pretrial services regime. The city should reject pretrial services that focus on supervision and compliance with onerous conditions such as electronic monitoring and drug testing, and instead move towards a supportive release model with an emphasis on ensuring individuals who are facing criminal charges have the support they need to return to court. The best way to do this is to provide tangible supports, such as cell phones, access to transportation. These actions have demonstrated positive effects on return to court. It's critical that pretrial services not simply become a new mechanism of surveillance and control. And in most cases, the least restrictive conditions that will reasonably ensure a person's return to court are no conditions at all. Moving on, the new bail statute requires judges to take an individual's financial circumstances and ability to pay into account when making bail determinations. To effectively obtain accurate information about this, defense attorneys should serve as gatekeepers between their clients and the independent organization who conducts the interview. There is a model for this process already in place. The Vera Institute created a bail calculator questionnaire, questionnaire which it piloted over the last year, and we're recommending that this practice continue and specifically that the calculations be made at the defense attorney's request. Finally, the city should direct resources to provide services for people before they even reach the court system. Under the new law, most individuals charged with misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies must be issued an appearance ticket from the NYPD rather than being arrested and put through the system. Arraignment will be scheduled within 20 days of the issuance of the ticket. In the interim, many of these individuals will seek legal counsel from defender offices. This change will necessitate increased funding to enable the city's public defenders to effectively represent and advise large number of potential clients seeking legal assistance prior to arraignments with the hope of resolving these cases expeditiously. Effective interve intervention at this early stage of a case can help save someone from losing their job, effectively navigate complicated immigration consequences, avoid the removal of children, prevent eviction, and avoid having criminal charges filed altogether. Moreover, the quicker a person is connected to counsel, the less likely they are to miss their court date, and the quicker the case can be resolved, preserving resources down the line. Defenders play a critical role in this process. I'm, I'm almost done. With change comes opportunity, and the time has come to radically transform our way, our system of pretrial release, and drastically reduce the number of people who are held at Rikers Island awaiting trial. The Council should continue to lead the way on criminal justice reform and take the affirmation steps to ensure that the promise of the criminal justice system reform legislation is actually realized in its implementation. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Maureen Jai. I am the supervising attorney of the Decarceration Project at the Legal Aid Society, uh, which deals fundamentally with bail litigation and policy. But today, I am here to talk about discovery. 
Um, and I think I have the very easy job of agreeing with the district attorneys who testified earlier today um, in saying that the new discovery bill that was passed um, in Albany uh, does represent a seismic change in how our criminal legal system um, will operate. Um, we will require uh, state-of-the-art electronic systems in order to implement um, discovery reform and that all of these changes will cost money um, and funding that will need to be provided uh, from this council. So I want to say thank you for uh, giving us the time to come here um, and testify about these um, issues. So we also believe that the most important uh, part of successfully transitioning into an open file discovery law will be the adoption of new and improved electronic information sharing technologies that will facilitate the transmission of materials from the police to the DAs and then finally to defense counsel. Uh, we are asking the council, uh, the city council to assist DAs, the police department, and defender offices in procuring um, digitized systems to collect discovery and to share discovery. And as previously mentioned, discovery um, kind of happens in two parts here. Uh, the police share information with the DAs. In turn, the DAs share information with us, defense counsel, um, and vice versa. A key step towards successful implementation will be one, training police officers on the need for timely disclosure of all materials to the DAs. Um, practitioners in other states that have open file discovery have warned that officers who are unfamiliar with um, discovery rules or what they perceive to be material or not material um, often inadvertently um, break the law uh, by not providing DAs with the discovery material that they are supposed to. So we do believe that step one is training police officers to actually hand over all of the information that they have at their disposal. And the easiest way to do this is um, you know, step two, which is to get the technology that would make it easy for the police to transmit information to the DA and in turn for the DA to transmit that information to defense counsel. In other states, this looks like uh, you know, an online portal, as was mentioned earlier. Um, there's one being used in Dallas, Texas, another in Colorado, where there are case indexes, there's documents that can be placed in there. Police can access it um, to input information. DAs can access it, and then uh, defense attorneys who are um, allowed are also allowed to access that same system and everyone could go into this portal to get um, evidence that is needed in a case. Uh, district attorney's offices, uh, the police, court administration, this council, uh, we believe should all be surveying uh, which systems are being used across the country and to find one that would be best uh, to be used in New York City. Um, finally, the um, Part of that is going to be funding um, all of these uh, stakeholders to be able to procure this system, to be able to maintain it, to have people who can be able to use it. Uh, for defenders, um, as you know from our prior uh, budget uh, testimony, we have really high attrition rates. So for us, that also includes having defense attorneys who will actually be working in our offices to be able to access that discovery, um, which is why we think that uh, pay parity, along with funding these uh, new technological advances, are all uh, going to be essential to the implementation of all of these new um, pretrial reforms. And speaking of funding, another issue um, is that we're not going to save money by accident here. Um, currently, New York City is spending a billion dollars on DOC. Um, they are getting more staff, more money. We are spending the same amount of money to incarcerate individuals, even though the population of people being incarcerated is decreasing. So we have higher costs, a declining population, higher violence um, in these jails. And what we need to be doing is divesting and moving money away from the jail industrial complex and moving that money towards reinvestment in the communities that are being affected uh, by mass incarceration and to 
the technology and funding needed by the public defender's offices to effectuate these changes. So thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sergio Dallapava. I'm the legal director of New York County Defender Services. Thank you not just for having this hearing, which I think is critically important, but also for giving our office the opportunity to give its perspective. Uh, you have our written testimony, which addresses all three of the major reforms areas to go into effect in January, but I'm going to mainly focus my remarks on the speedy trial reforms. Now, in my opinion, the speedy trial reforms recognize and implicitly assert that the most dignified and constitutionally firm ending to a criminal case is a jury trial. Certainly, our office uh, strongly believes that one of the most powerful weapons we deploy in addressing the iniquities of the criminal justice system is the capacity to take a case to trial and then conduct that trial at the highest level. But if this right to trial is such a powerful weapon, one must ask oneself why it is that it's so rarely deployed in this city. Um, the stats are familiar to everyone. Uh, how few cases are actually, how few criminal trials are actually conducted. And I'll give the answer to what, what is the cause for that, but also maybe surprisingly assert that there's something that the city council can do to alleviate this problem. There's a thing called, that we're all familiar with in the system, called the trial penalty or the trial tax. It basically means that a great deal of pressure is going to be exerted on your client, if you're a public defender, by the judiciary, by prosecutors, by everyone involved in the system to take a plea, to plead guilty, rather than to exercise their right to a trial, their most prized constitutional right in our system. And the way that that pressure is going to be exerted is, our clients are going to be informed in so many words that if they exercise their right to a trial and the trial doesn't go their way, they're going to receive a very enhanced sentence. One of the many reasons why this is illegitimate, despite the fact, um, particularly because it's interfering with a prized constitutional right, is that in the vast majority of cases, what would constitute a proper sentence if the defendant committed the conduct that they're accused of is readily apparent before a trial is conducted. This is clearly a punishment for exercising a constitutional right. Now, where these reforms come in and where the council maybe can play a role is that defenders of the penalty will likely say something like, the system does not have the capacity to try every case or to try even a higher percentage of cases, and that's why defendants are rewarded for pleading guilty and saving us the resources. Now, the problem with that, and there may be some truth to that, because I've been practicing for more than 20 years here in Manhattan, and it's not uncommon for both parties to declare that they are ready to proceed to trial, only to be told that there is no courtroom with which to conduct that trial in, and that they need to come back four weeks later, five weeks later, in criminal court, maybe even two months later. And this is not a problem uh, unique to Manhattan. I, my understanding is that it's even worse in the other boroughs. Um, so I think, um, to echo what many of my colleagues have said, the reforms on paper are thrilling and great, and they feel like a long-sought victory. But if they're not properly funded, if steps aren't taken by the system to ensure that the trials that are being promised, because I think the reforms many feel will lead to more trials, and that's a good thing for the system, if we don't have the capacity to conduct these trials in a fair way, if we don't have the capacity to inform our clients that this prized right that they have is not just a paper right, but a true right, then I think the reforms fail. And I've heard, in listening to all the testimony today, I heard more than one district attorney refer to there's a decrease in inventory. Inventory, as if they were talking about perishable goods or an inanimate object. What they were referring to is human beings, mostly indigent people of color, in vulnerable communities who are charged with the loss of liberty, are facing the loss of liberty. It's not inventory. It's our Constitution. It's the right to fair trial. It's the bedrock principles of our society. We must, between now and January, assure that when these reforms go into play, that when they go into effect, that the, the defense bar, the indigent defenders of this, have the ability to make powerful use of these reforms. And part of that is ensuring that an increase in trial can increase in trials can be dealt with by the system. Thank you. First, let me thank you all for
coordinating your testimony so that each of you took a segment that was very impressive and very much appreciated. Um, have your offices been consulted by Mach J or, or OMB about what um, additional funding uh, you might need to be able to meet your obligations under these, under these new laws? Speaking for my office, we have not. No. I can't say that we have about funding. Uh, with respect to funding, no. Uh, with implementation, we have had um, probably at least two meetings. All right. And last, on fun just funding. Yes, it's my understanding that there has been discussions specifically about pre funding pre-arraignment representation, um, but there hasn't been any really firm or any sort of commitment that that funding is forthcoming okay. from Mach J. For the other offices, any any um, conversations on implementation and, and just what kind of topics were, were you, uh, was, was, was discussed with you? Well, um, for one, uh, the expansion of uh, pretrial services. Um, in New York City, it's called supervised release, obviously. Supervised release, as you know, is very limited. Uh, it's very charge-based, so some misdemeanors are not eligible just because of the type of case. All violent felonies are not eligible. Um, so we would like to, obviously, um, this is, we are in agreement with the Bronx defenders that supervised release or pretrial services should not be charge based at all uh, if we're looking towards maximum decarceration. Um, in terms of uh, other areas, not, not really. I, I I do uh, want to address, um, the DAs were very concerned that they needed additional funding with respect to discovery compliance because there's going to be a much greater need to seek protective orders. Uh, and I just wanted to address that. We in Brooklyn have had an open file discovery practice with the DA's office for a long, long time. Um, and they do turn over witness names. Yes, there are instances when they do need to seek a protective order, but it is nowhere near as great as the number um, that the DAs were testifying about earlier today. So we would just ask that if there is funding provided to the DA's office that it not be used as a way to circumvent the discovery laws. Uh, we are in agreement that there has to be additional funding so that there can be perhaps an electronic portal uh, to provide for the more efficient flow of information between NYPD, the prosecutors, and uh, defense, uh, all defense counsel, not just the public defenders. I would uh, like to bring it to the council's attention also that right now the city's main program, our only program, is supervised release. And what we um, detail in our report, in the written uh, submission, is that we would like to move away from a system or that only has one option which is the surveillance of people, just tracking them to make sure that they're still around um, because that is not replacement for support um, to actually get people to come back to court. So what we are ultimately seeking is for supervised release to actually shrink and to become an alternative to detention for people who would be eligible for money bail and that the city or CJA actually um, develop a true pretrial services agency that is client-centered um, and that is not based on surveillance and that actually supports um, people in coming back to court, um, whether that is transportation assistance, um, helping people find childcare, um, you know, benefits, all of the things that we know people need in order to successfully uh, make their court dates. <clears throat> Have you had consultations with your respective district attorney's offices on how to cooperate and coordinate? Does that, does that happen? I'm gonna be above my pay grade. I know that we, we asked uh, the DA's office, for example, um, to, to the extent possible to institute some of these bail reforms early, as you mentioned um, earlier during the hearing. And I think, uh, I, I found it interesting that um, ADA, uh, a DA Vance said that there was about 6,000 people who, who this year are, are eligible for bail, but next year will be ineligible for bail, and these were misdemeanors. You know, there's no rule that says that he can't stop asking for bail in those cases mm. today, 
and, and basically remove that, that, um, that burden on those 6,000 people. And that's exactly what we asked him to do in, in a letter about a week ago. We've gotten, you know, obviously uh, he has not uh, changed up his policy, has not said that he ag agrees with us that that's what he should do between today and January 1st. So let's ask about January 1st. January 1st comes and there'll be people sitting in Rikers who under the, 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 the law at that, at that moment would otherwise not be, um, the cash bail would not be, be permitted. I don't recall that the statute deals with people in those well, circumstances. Well, my understanding, um, young me probably knows better than me, but that on that date, those people need to be released if, if they're in. That, on, that, that's in the state law. That, that, that's in the statute, is that correct? Uh, there won't be a mechanism to hold that. Once the law changes, there won't be anything in there that says that anyone who was in before, for example, um, is subject to the old law. Once the new law is in effect, everyone who has to be subject to it. Um, so there will be no mechanism of detaining people at that point who would have been de subject to detention under the well, old they, law. Well, they will be detained. They will be in Rikers. Somebody no legal mechanism, right. no lawful mechanism, I should say. Right, but okay. so somebody at DOC has got to know, okay, I guess 1159, December 31st, you all walked out the door. Exactly. Uh, it, it's not, the law of retroactivity um, doesn't apply. It's, it's just statutorily, it's a clear mandate. Certain crimes, um, those people have to be released. They're not eligible for money bail. And so they would have to be statutorily well, released. Let me, but let me ask you, they are, they are still eligible potentially for supervised release. Have, has there been any conversations? I, I wonder, I should have asked the DAs, I wonder if the DAs are planning to do a, uh, uh, a canvassing of all the individuals who will be ineligible to be detained on cash bail on January 1st and whether or not they are planning, I don't know, to initiate hearings in advance saying Mr. Lanceman is going to be released on January 1st because he can't be held for cash bail for what he's charged with but judge, we would like him to be in a supervised release program as opposed to being released on his own recognizance. I, I think the issue with that is twofold. Num number one, right now there is no program that those, most of those people would be eligible for. So that's the first issue. The, the second issue, which I think is the most important issue, is that that's not the population we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on the people who are still eligible to be held on money bail and providing alternatives to release for them, because the legislature has made a determination that those people who aren't eligible for money bail should be released. While maybe some sort of supportive services should be available to them, the real population that we urge the city to focus on providing pretrial release alternatives for is the people that will still be eligible to be held. Because if we leave those people out, there's gonna be no alternative. And, the, and really the law does require the least restrictive alternative, even for people who are eligible for, for money bail. So we urge the, the city and the council to focus on developing alternatives to release for those violent offenses that are still eligible for money bail. I, I just also want to add, just to follow up on uh, what Eli was saying, um, we, we are prepared to, to litigate in the form of writs to, to get people out as soon as possible, and we're currently doing that. So in terms of the public defenders, we're prepared. Uh, OCA, however, should be prepared to handle all the writs that will be coming, uh, forthcoming. Everyone with cash bail or even those who are on remand status, um, they will all require that third mandatory form, uh, alternative form of bail, which is unsecured bond as well uh, or partially secured bond. So um, the implementation obviously requires OCA, um, the agencies that have contracts with the mayor's office to provide the pretrial services as well as um, the DA's offices to make things move smoothly, efficiently, because there are plenty of cases where the DA's could be consenting to release, uh, straight release, without any conditions. And that third form of bail can be set now on every case where somebody is in Rikers on bail now, and there is nothing stopping us from doing that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
So um, next we're going to hear from the bail funds, the, the representative from the Liberty Fund, a representative from the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund, and the Bronx Freedom Fund. And I understand also there's a representative from the Lippman Commission. And why don't they come up? And then the next panel will be um, um, mostly the uh, advocacy organizations that are here with us today. Good, uh, good late afternoon to everyone. I raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll start from my left to the right. Just introduce yourself. Um, you got five minutes on the clock, and uh, we would like to get out of here soon. I want to thank Chair Chairman Lansman and all the City Council members and staff. Sorry, just, just move that closer and good. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Chairman Lansman and all the City Council members and staff for allowing me to testify today. My name is David Long and I am the Executive Director of the Liberty Fund. The Liberty Fund is the New York City Council sponsored charitable bail fund that operates in all five boroughs of New York City. Our bail associates are in the arraignment court parts every night from 6 p.m. until court closes at 1 a.m. Or, or later. This unique setup allows us to post bail immediately after it has been set and results in our clients being released directly from court and never entering into the Department of Corrections admittance process. Instead of going to Rikers that night, and in all likelihood several more nights, they are leaving court and going home to resume their lives. The Liberty Fund began operations in August 2017, and along with my testimony today, I've submitted our summary report with data on our first year of operations. Highlights of our successes include the fact that we have posted bail for over 830 men and women, all of whom could not afford their misdemeanor bail. We have achieved an 87% court appearance rate, and an extremely conservative estimate have prevented approximately 40,000 days of pretrial detention and costs. Additionally, we have made close to 300 social service referrals for our clients in need areas such as housing, education, legal services, and substance abuse. Clearly, clearly the legal the Liberty Fund has been an important stabilizing factor in our clients' lives, intervening during the tumultuous period that occurs post arrest and continuing during the pendency of their court cases. For the bail system as it currently operates, charitable bail fun funds serve a vital purpose in the efforts to keep individuals arrested for misdemeanors who have not been found guilty of any charges charges in the community and out of our correctional system. The Liberty Fund has been a vital and important player in the efforts to alleviate some of the issues of our broken bail system. But this hearing today is, is about the future of bail and what this landscape will look like come January 1st, 2020. As everyone in this room is aware, on April 1st, the New York State passed sweeping cr criminal justice reform legislation that drastically limits money bail and pretrial detention mo for most misdemeanors and nonviolent felony offenders along with requiring prosecutors to disclose their evidence to defense earlier in case proceedings and a promotion of speedy trial rights. In this changing landscape, the Liberty Fund can be a beacon organization that provides a stabilizing effect on the wind down of bail while simultaneously involve, evolving into a valuable and much needed response to the increasing number of individuals who will no longer be getting bail and instead released on their own recognizance or ROR. The Liberty Fund will be able to use its experience and respected presence in the court setting to be a proactive and productive response to this monumental reform effort by providing voluntary enhanced case management and court reminders to a vulnerable population. The Liberty Fund is uniquely positioned to allow the New York City Council to be an innovative leader in New York City's shifting criminal and social justice settings. The bail reform measures taking place in 2020 
does not eliminate the serious need for case management assistance for pretrial population. In fact, it actually increases it. Below is the outline on how the Liberty Fund will be an integral and important part of the next fiscal year with the responsive programming in the pretrial service area. As misdemeanor bail is drastically reduced in January 2020, the Liberty Fund programming will shift to the ROR case management program to provide cap comprehensive pretrial case management services for individuals released on their own recognizance. Dedicated social workers and case managers from the Liberty Fund will work with individuals securing and na navigating needed community-based services while providing case notification and monitoring. The target population for this program will continue to be individuals charged with misdemeanor crimes as it was with our bail program, but now the focus will be on the ROR population, which comprised nearly 80,000 people in 2018 alone. We anticipate this number to increase after January. The pretrial time period is, a criti is, is a critical for our target population and often determines whether the person ceases further criminal justice involvement or recidivates back into the system. Responsive interventions during this pretrial period are critical in keeping these individuals, individuals from rearresting. By bringing the knowledge and experience of being a successful ba charitable bail fund, the Liberty Fund will incorporate our expertise de developed from working with the pretrial population into an impactful voluntary social service that can be benefit both the bail and ROR population to make their court dates, navigate their lives more efficiently, and prevent future involvement with the criminal justice system. In conclusion, I have personally been involved in the criminal justice system for over 30 years as a police officer, probation attorney, and project director of several alternative to detention and incarceration programs. In my humble opinion, this reformative moment in time is providing a unique and dual opportunity to tr transform our bail practices while also providing a chance to establish critical voluntary programs as an integral part of transforming our criminal justice system into a more humane and fair one that administers authentic justice for those arrested and the community as a whole. Thank you for your time today. I'll wait for today. Great. Uh, good afternoon, council member. Um, all kind of save you some time and just echo many of the sentiments that have been shared. I'm Elena Weissman. I'm the director of the Bronx Freedom Fund. Um, we're a community bail fund. I think you know already how we work. Um, and so, yes, just to echo uh, where we stand poised to kind of continue the fight um, to end money bail totally. Uh, but what I do want to quickly add in my time are two things that I think the council can take a lead role in um, as we prepare for implementation. The first uh, is a topic that we have discussed with this committee a lot, um, which is Department of Correction compliance. Um, we urge the council to take the necessary steps to urge to ensure that the department will comply with the release provisions of the new law. Over the last two years, we've monitored DOC's compliance with existing city council laws, um, and we've documented widespread noncompliance. And even after multiple oversight hearings, media reports, and meetings with the department itself, we're still seeing our clients held in over the legal limit. So the question is, if DOC still hasn't complied with the modification of their existing release standards, how can we expect them to voluntarily comply with an entirely new provision? So we, we just asked the council to work with DOC to codify plans for timely release and immediate release, um, especially now that people can get out through alternative means like unsecured bonds and non-monetary conditions. Um, and we also would urge the council to identify accountability mechanisms to ensure compliance with the existing local laws with, on the Department of Correction and the, the upcoming ones too. Um, and on the note of the non-monetary conditions, we would also urge the council to look to um, the model of the bail funds when considering what a non-monetary condition looks like. We're very troubled, like others have said, with the potential replacement of cash bail with another oppressive system um, with mandatory structures like electronic monitoring, mandatory drug testing, etc. 95% um, of our clients return for all of their court dates without money on the line and with no mandatory restrictions. Instead of requiring our clients to submit to drug tests or wear an ankle shackle, we send effective court reminders and we offer voluntary support to our clients. The intervention is very simple. We remind our clients about court through whatever means they prefer. If a client does express the need for an additional support structure in returning to court or in otherwise obtaining stability, we offer voluntary referrals. This could be as simple as providing a MetroCard. 
Um, and what we've seen is that people return to court not because they are compelled to, but because they want to, and if they have the means to. So we ask, again, the council to continue its commitment um, to limiting the harm and the net whiting and the collateral consequences of the criminal legal system um, and work towards a, a long-term solution. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Um, there's more in the written testimony, but I'll cede my time. Good afternoon, um, and thank you, Chairman, for the invitation to testify today. My name is Zoe Adele, and I'm the Advocacy and Policy Associate at the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund, a community bail fund that has paid bail for over 4,200 New Yorkers who would otherwise be jailed pre-trial because they can't afford to purchase their freedom. Um, I've included all of my points in my written testimony that I submitted, um, so I'll just use my remaining time to focus on um, two points. Under the new statute, uh, police officers must issue appearance tickets for many people accused of misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies. Unfortunately, the legislation includes a number of carve-outs that could result in people being denied the protections of the law and unnecessarily detained for up to a day, sometimes based on a police officer's subjective determination as to whom these exceptions apply. For example, police are not required to issue an appearance ticket if they believe the accused person would benefit from medical or mental health care. So we urge City Council to provide careful oversight and mandate that the NYPD keep track and make public all instances when an officer does not issue an appearance ticket, including which exceptions are used. The legislation also mandates that any instrument used in release decisions or conditions of release should be empirically validated and free from discrimination or bias. We know firsthand that tools created to assess risk of flight or dangerousness in and of themselves do not guarantee that fewer presumptively innocent people will be jailed. 80% of our clients are considered in intermediate or high risk of non-return by the CJA, the agency that conducts risk assessments. Um, yet 95% of our clients make all their required court dates with no personal financial incentive or conditions. So acknowledging the pitfalls of risk assessment instruments and that real reform means addressing the underlying structural inequalities that disproportionately impact communities of color, City Council should work to ensure that agencies charged with the risk assessment tools creation and use comply with state law to mitigate harm and racial discrimination and have a transparent community-centered process for evaluating and revalidating the assessment tool. And I'll just add that while the new law will protect pretrial liberty for those accused of most misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies, we must recognize that it only maintains the presumption of innocence for some people and still leaves many behind. So we'll continue to push for the full and complete elimination of money bail, robust due process protections, and the end to pretrial incarceration for all New Yorkers. Until then, we urge City Council to do everything in its power to ensure that the bail reform legislation is implemented so it vastly reduces the number of New Yorkers and their families who are subjected to the trauma of pretrial detention and supervision. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Zachary Katz Nelson. I'm the policy director at the Littman Commission. And thank you for holding the hearing. Thank you as well for giving everyone five minutes, no matter where they're coming from. And I really appreciate that. It's unusual in these hearings, and I'm grateful for that on behalf of everybody who's had the chance to speak. Uh, frankly, the fact that we you don't we don't always make that happen. So I don't want you to, I don't want you to think too too good of me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, but I think the, the fact that you've had had this hearing is is fantastic. And I think having if you if it's possible to have additional hearings before January 1st and then hopefully afterwards as well for, for the council to continue that, that type of oversight I think would be critical because it really forces everyone in the system to reckon with what's happening and what they've got going on and to realize they should communicate better because I'm sure that is not happening to the extent it should be. Um, you know, as we think about it from the Litman Commission about how can we continue to safely drive down levels of incarceration, bring us closer to closing Rikers, bring us uh, closer to a smaller borough-based jail system and have that as small as possible, think about ways that we can expand supervised release and other pretrial alternatives. The reality is, of course, those don't exist to the extent they should now. We believe that should, cities should explore expanding supervised relief el release eligibility to other charged crimes, no question. Uh, but, but critical to this as well is that hopefully when those are expanded, people need the judges Everybody in the system, the DAs, need to feel comfortable with the programs, need to know they even exist. I think there's an information gap that exists now where people don't know that their programs are available or don't know what, they, what services they provide. 
And so we would propose that there would be a centralized clearinghouse in each borough courthouse to provide that information, to understand, and to brief the judges, to brief the DA, DAs and the PDs and everybody who's involved on what the options are so we can really start to drive down the levels of incarceration for people that continue to be bail eligible. Uh, we think that, just want to touch on that, there are, for instance, for people who are homeless and issues of just, it's something in my written testimony, but I'll start first. The VERA assessment, the bail uh, assessment pilot that's going on now, we really do think that should be looked at very carefully and whether that can be expanded, because that's a critical component. Uh, and DOC then, as, as was mentioned just a few minutes ago, they need to be ready to accept partially and unsecured bonds, and they need to have infrastructure in place to do that. Uh, and that's something that hopefully the council can, can, can talk to them about. Um, I would just also say, in terms of people who are homeless, there needs to be some system in place, and this is about coordination across agencies, that homeless services, for instance, needs to be engaged and involved in. How do we get notice to them to make sure that they make court appearances? How do we ensure the DAT process and other processes that are in place are actually going to work? And it's going to take a lot more than just the people that were in this room. And that goes for the NYPD as well, as you've alluded to and other folks here have alluded to. They're first, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, for instance, they all need to have processes in place and technology in place to make sure that they're turning over discovery as swiftly as possible. And so I, I would just leave it there just to reiterate, thank you again, and please hold as many hearings as you can. I know it's a huge undertaking. It's not simply you're sitting here for hours. We're grateful, but it really does make a difference in this. So thank you. Thank you. So let me ask a, uh, a provocative question to the bail funds. Right? Under the law, um, you are limited to um, serving people who are charged with a misdemeanor and bail is set at $2,000 or less. Under the law that's coming, people charged with misdemeanors, except in a couple of very narrow circumstances, um, will not have cash bail set. So doesn't the law put you out of business? It, it would uh, if the charitable bail law doesn't expand, which it's being voted to, to do. And so is, the is Senate that, so, passed so it. one way that you're not out of business is if the charitable bail law is, is expanded or amended to include people who are charged with the kinds of felonies that cash bail can still be set on, right? And I would just add that it also comes But you got to have the mic. You got to have the mic. Um, it also comes down to all the exceptions that are in the law. So paying attention to whether or not those are used, um, that would also. Well, so let, let's take each of those in turn. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not following what's going on in, in Albany right now. Perhaps you are. Is an expansion of the bail fund, bail funds, something that is uh, on the table, being actively considered, or? Albany's done criminal justice reform for the session, moving on to other things. No, Do you know? The Senate passed it already to expand to $10,000, and now the Assembly is poised to pass it, too. Well, it's but not just the amount, right, but it's the eligible. And felonies. I yeah. got it. Um, Interesting. Okay. It would be great if this law had eliminated cash bill altogether, and then we would be very, ex I think I speak for both of us, all of us, I, maybe that we would uh, love to go out of business, but um, there's a question of, ongoing need, um, even with the ability to pay mechanism, uh, as we see kind of like how that shakes out, um, whether it's being followed and implemented to the fullest extent, can people actually afford their bail, um, or are they still gonna go to jail for not having money? So, and then the second part of that is, right, there are exceptions for certain kinds of misdemeanors, contempt. Um, what percentage of your current, um, uh, clients are are would still be eligible or would still um, be um, yeah eligible for cash bail even if Albany does not amend and expand the the, the state's charitable bail law just each of your organizations could could give me a, a, a rough estimate have you thought about that yeah um, I think ours is like 20 to 25 percent of people um, but it depends on the borough, depends on the month, depends on the judge. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of have like historic um, last couple of years data. Okay. And, and you, do you have? I don't have specific numbers, but I would assume it's probably somewhere around. Okay. 
Yeah, the, our numbers are pretty close too. We have looked at in the last two years that we've been running the bail fund, and it would be somewhere between about 15 to 20 percent is what we've looked at. Um, you know, but as a, as my testimony stated, I think that the Liberty Fund can be you know, a valuable organization going forward to really kind of fill the void. Listening to all the testimony today and and the potential chaos that's uh, on the horizon come January 1st, uh, the Liberty Fund has already the experience to show. Uh, that they can be part of the uh, uh, services for the ROR population. So that's our, where we're going as an organization. And the Lipman Commission, you know, when, when the Lipman Commission report originally came out and people uh, asked, well, how can you reduce the population at Rikers Island by the dramatic numbers that you're talking about? I used to say supervised release, supervised release, supervised release. Do you know... Um, uh, within the, uh, the the supervised release community, uh, how and, and your interactions with Mock J, like how seriously are people looking at expanding the eligibility to allow for the people who are now going to be the only ones who are who potentially have cash bail set? They, I'll tell you. <clears throat> um, we had a hearing where Judge Lippman came and testified, and then the the, the, the criminal justice uh, director of the mayor's office of criminal justice came and testified, and, and we were trying to push Mock J to expand eligibility to beyond just the, the, the kind of low-level, low-hanging fruit that exists now, and, and all we were able to get was this very modest pilot project in, in Brooklyn. So are you, are you feeling and seeing that, that the tide is turning and that that supervised release is going to be expanded to meet what will be the real need come January? Uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, we have not gotten any commitment from Mock J, for instance, for an expansion. I, I think that they, the results of the pilot will hopefully push them and demonstrate that it's possible to do. And I think that the, there'll be more attention. I think this is a, because fewer people will be in jail to begin with, there'll be more attention paid on the folks who remain. And so that'll give us an opportunity to focus even more on people who are accused of violent crimes. Uh, I think that that's a, an issue that we at the Litman Commission really feel needs to pay much more attention to generally in terms of charging decisions by the DAs, in terms of the ways that people are approaching violent uh, crime allegations in general. And so I think that it's something that we hope to focus on more and hope that we'll be able to continue to discover, talk about with Mock J. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, next we have a representative from the LGBT Center, a representative from Just Leadership USA, Close Rikers campaign, um, a representative from the New York Civil Liberties Union, a representative from the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. If you will come on down. All right, let's, um, anyone, anyone else? I did. Okay. Well, if we could, have, I'm sorry, if we could have just one representative giving testimony from, from each organization. So you decide whoever you would like that to be.
All right, let's all get sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Terrific. Um, we'll start from my left. You have five minutes. Please uh, state your name. Thank you for having me. Good morning. My name is Aaron Sanders, and I'm the Outreach and Organizing Coordinator at the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center, also referred to as the Center, which is located in West Village. In my former role, I was a community liaison at Friends of Island Academy, a nonprofit organization that advocates for justice-involved youth while they are incarcerated at Rikers Island and they provide support thereafter. New York City's LGBT community formed the center in 1983 in response to the HIV AIDS epidemic, ensuring a place for LG LGBTQ people to access information, care, and support they were not receiving elsewhere. Today, the center has become the largest LGBTQ community center on the East Coast, where we host over 400 community group meetings each month and welcome over 6,000 individuals each week. We are proud to offer services to New Yorkers across the five boroughs, ensuring that all LGBTQ New Yorkers can call the center home. The center has a solid track record of working for and with the community to increase access to a diverse range of services and resources, including services for LGBTQ immigrants, substance use recovery programming for adults and youth, economic justice initiatives, and our youth leadership and engagement program. Following the 2016 election, the center revised a strategic plan to include statewide advocacy, a program we now, now, now call Rise Out. The initiative is a collective of community leaders and allies from every region in New York State, working together to advance LGBTQ affirming legislation and policy statewide. Through our outreach and conveying of stakeholders statewide, we identified restorative justice as a shared goal, and as a result, restorative justice is a key focus of our advocacy efforts. For the center, restorative justice means st standing up for the community members who are most often negatively impacted by a system intended to help them, particularly transgender and gender nonconforming community members, as well as queer people of color. In order to work towards our goal of receiving, of advancing restorative justice, rather, the center recommends the following. The city council should take the necessary steps to ensure that pre-child reforms have the greatest decarceral effect when implemented. For example, in 2018, 72% of New Yorkers were released on their own recognizance. City council must ensure that we do not see a decrease in this percentage under the new legislation. The city council should require training for police departments to implement the, the appearance ticket portion of the legislation and must ensure oversight of NYPD. We also recommend that the NYPD keep track of and make public all instances when, a, when an officer does not issue an appearance ticket. In cases where judges can still set money bill, the city council should require a timely facilitation and processing of unsecured and partially secured bill payment. The city council should ensure that judges are complying with the mandate to consider a person's ability to pay when setting bail. And in order to have an accountable implementation process, the city council must set up a pretrial implementation committee that includes community organizations and impacted people. Lastly, money bail continues to be unjust, discriminatory, and criminalize low-income people and communities of color. While this issue may not be directly under the center's purview, the center is committed to working with administration, the administration, the city council to push the state legislator to enact further bail reform legislation that ends money bail and protects the due process for all people. We welcome the opportunity to partner, partner and help realize any recommendations referenced above. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to provide this testimony today and issue and to provide this testimony on a great issue and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. How's everyone doing? So good. far, so good. That's good. Good to hear. Um, my name is Akila Tomlinson, and I am a member of the Close Rikers campaign through Just Leadership USA. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to present my views to the committee. I serve, as one as, I serve as one of many advocates for comprehensive criminal justice reform. Today, I'm here to express my concerns and offer solutions to pretrial legislation. As someone who has been indirectly affected by the current conditions of the criminal justice system, I want to assure that those arrested are treated fairly. In 2017, my brother was arrested for a crime he did not commit. Today marks the 645th day 
that my brother has been sitting in a cell on Rikers Island. The presumption of innocent until proven guilty has not been given to my brother. He is already being treated as if he were convicted of the crime he is being accused of committing. Every court date since his arrest continues to be rescheduled despite the prosecution having little to no evidence to present in court. He deserves to be treated fairly, as does every person who is arrested. Although the prison population has shown decline, there are still too many defendants detained pretrial. As an alternative, supervised release programs have been implemented and has resulted in a decrease to the prison population. However, it is concerning that defendants eligible for supervised release in New York is determined by a risk assessment tool. Algorithms that determine the risk of the defendant can be detrimental to real reform since it could potentially exclude people from the program that need it the most, people like my brother. Alternatives to pre-child detainment like supervised release programs can be beneficial if it is implemented the right way, as excessive monitoring to already over-policed areas could be harmful. It is important to consider the use of the city's asset forfeiture fund to reinvest in community programs that will aid in providing specialized mental health services, substance abuse counseling, employment, and housing. What we need are reforms to ensure fewer people will be detained pre-child. We must have dedicated reinvestment into communities, including funding community-based alternative incarceration programs to scale, expanding transitional housing opportunities and removing barriers to employment and housing for people with criminal records. We can get this investment from the police budget knowing that crime has, is going down. Also the, the Department of Correctional budget knowing that incarceration is also dropping. According to the Litman Commission, the Rikers Island being closed would estimate to have a leftover fund of $570 million. I look forward to working with you guys in the future on these issues and concerns and open to hear what you guys have to say. Hi, Chair Lansman. Um, my name is Nicole Triplett uh, with the New York Civil Liberties Union, an affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, so because many of those who've spoken before me have already articulated why we're here and, and the problems that we're seeking to address and, and the contents of the pretrial bills, I'm just going to jump to the recommendations um, that we would like for the city council to pursue within its um, oversight authority. Uh, so because the city, because of the injustices in the city's um, pretrial practices, we urge the city council to do everything in its power to ensure that everyone gets to enjoy the presumption of innocence. Um, in doing so, we recommend the following actions. One, um, as it's already been stated, uh, but we, we recommend ensuring robust su supplemental funding for pretrial services, diversion programs, community-based programs, and solid reinvestment in housing, health care, and education programs. Uh, two, we want uh, the City Council to, within its oversight authority, uh, prevent practices that may lead to net widening and unintended consequences that may, may sustain our current pretrial jailing practices. So um, to do that, we, we're recommending that you work with the Office of Court Administration to one, ensure that judges are complying with one of the mandates in the, the bill legislation that would um, force courts, force judges to consider ability to pay um, when they do set bail. Otherwise, we're still going to have people in jail and pre-trial detention um, due to the size of their bank account or due to wealth-based factors. Uh, two, we want uh, the City Council to continue to work with Criminal Justice Agency and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, MOCJ, to place additional limitations on the use of harmful pre-trial conditions, um, including establishing stringent um, electronic monitoring restrictions and barring drug testing as a pretrial condition. Uh, we also want, uh, as has already been said, we stated, uh, you know, despite the, the real complications and challenges, uh, we do think that these type of reforms can be phased in now as opposed to having DAs and, and other stakeholders wait until January 1st. Uh, we also would like for the City Council to work with the New York, policy, uh, New York Police Department to ensure that they change their police practices now to effectively implement the appearance ticket um, provisions of the bill. Uh, also work with uh, district attorney offices to ensure that they begin allocating funding and resources for implementing uh, discovery and bail reforms. And then 
This is key. Uh, we would we would love for the city council to to track data on case outcomes, including who is being subject to pre who will continue to be subject to pretrial detention and for how long, and then patterns in prosecutorial charging and the time it takes for case disposition. Uh, this can really uh, be critical in tracking how much of a success um, the 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 letter of the law. Um, will actually uh, be, and, and then also trying to really identify any unintended practices and abusive practices. And I just want to close by saying, you know, as a civil liberties organization, these reforms are of paramount importance to us. Um, the city cannot afford to continue to jail people based on pre prejudicial biases, wealth-based factors, and an inadequate uh, due process protections. Our lives, civil rights, human rights, and civil liberties are all at stake. So we urge you to support early and effective implementation of the new state laws, and we continue um, to look forward to working together um, toward the broader goal of overhauling pretrial jailing practices. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson uh, Lanceman, committee members, community. Uh, my name is Fred Parker. I'm here on behalf of Just Leadership USA, alongside campaigns such as Free New York, Hashtag Close Rikers, two, two Million Voices, uh, Half by 2030. Just wanted to uh, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to submit my testimony today and for your recognition that New York City must be a model for decarceration and, and accountability to impact the communities. As you already know, bail, discovery, and speedy trial legislation passed in New York State budget because of advocacy by people who have been personally impacted by this firsthand. It has become clear to me that to be accountable to the communities most devastated by money bail and pretrial incarceration, City Council must commit to three principles. First, City Council must commit to maximizing decarceration on its own the new bail legislation will vastly reduce the number of people who are subject to pretrial jailing. However, implementation matters. And I must stress that implementation matters in, in, in this situation. We can, we can and we must push forward for even greater expansion of, of pretrial liberties by working to limit the use of bail, even in cases where judges can still legally set it, and to create opportunities for release. Right now, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice prohibits services. This must be changed to maximize pretrial liberty. Civil Council must insist, I mean, uh, excuse me, City Council must insist that there be no categorical or charge-based restrictions or pretrial services. Second, City Council must limit net, net widening. As a young black person without a lot of money, like many people subjected to these systems, I am, I am not a flight risk. I do not have a passport, I do not have a private jet, and I definitely do not have access to a plastic surgeon who will change my face so I can run. As is evident in, in the city's data, the vast majority of people do not need supervision to ensure that they go back to court. Given this information, city council must work to maximize release on recognizance. In other words, all wall to ensure that we do not see an increase in pretrial conditions or carceral supervision under the new legislation. City Council must push New York City's Criminal Justice Agency, or the CJA, to move from a risk assessment model to a needs assessment model. City Council must also insist that, we, that when CJA rolls out their new assessment tool, there is a transparent community-centered process for evaluating the outcomes of that tool. The punitive, onerous nature of parole and probation is well documented, as we all know, and acknowledged by City Council in the support of the Less is More Act. Therefore, we must ensure that pretrial services do not come to resemble parole. To do this, City, City Council must establish additional limitations on the use of harmful pretrial conditions, including electronic monitoring and mandatory drug testing, as Ms. just um, stated. Neither neither of which of these items have ever been part of New York's pretrial uh, pre model to date or before. The use of electronic monitoring during pretrial uh, litigation should alarm everyone in this room. If ever there was a big brother technology in effect, electronic monitors are it. We have seen the harm they do in the, in the parole system. When a dear friend of mine 
was on parole. His ankle monitor malfunctioned and the police showed up to his home in full-blown SWAT mode, terrifying his elderly grandmother. We cannot and shall not allow electronic monitors to become a part of the pretrial system and worsen over-policing in communities of color. Finally, City Council must commit to community investment and community accountability. City Council must set up a pretrial implementation committee that includes community organizations and impacted people. Over the past 40 years, jail has become the catch-all for failures of policy and social support. We'll no longer stand for that. As these reforms reduce the number of people incarcerated pre-trial, we must have dedicated reinvestment into our communities. As black and brown New Yorkers know, jail does not produce safety. Housing, education, health care, and jobs are the key to safety and justice in our community. Thank you for your time. Good day. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for waiting uh, as long as you did to, to testify. Um, and that will close out our hearing. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Right next to Wingstop. It's close by there.